Testing one, two, three. Recording in progress. We'd like to welcome you to our regular board meeting, our regular school board meeting. Today is Monday, December 19th. Uh, current, uh, present in the boardroom. We have all board members are present in the boardroom. Thank you very much. We also have Dr. Bryant, our superintendent, and our executive secretary, Amanda Foster, uh, uh, on the dais. So with that, um, I'd like to invite our student representative to do the flag salute, followed by our land acknowledgement. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On behalf of the Anchorage School Board, I want to take a moment to recognize and offer gratitude for the sacred ancestral lands of the Denina people. We acknowledge and appreciate that our offices, facilities, and schools are on these sacred indigenous lands, and we honor the traditional care that has been given to this land throughout generations. We are grateful for the opportunity to grow, learn, work, and create educational communities on the sacred land. We extend continued respect for the many cultures, creativity, and its resilience of its indigenous peoples. Chanan. Thank you very much, Ms. Shaw. The board would like to welcome everyone to our meeting and thank you for attending and supporting the work of the Anchorage School Board. Uh, the board uh, thanks uh, our students, parents, teachers, staff, school business partners, and the entire community for your investment in our district with your time, your talent, and your tax dollars. Uh, next, that brings us to item three, approval of the agenda. Madam President, I move to approve the agenda as presented. Thank you. If we are going to make any uh, adjustments to the agenda, uh, we need to adjust them now. Okay. All right. Seeing no um, adjustments, the agenda is approved as it is uh, presented. Is there any opposition? Who was the second on that? Uh, the, oh, Member Higgins, thank you. So the seeing no opposition, the agenda is approved as presented. Thank you. And this brings us to our reports, starting with our student report. I'm sorry, Amanda, do you need a minute? No. Okay. We need a slight pause. Thank you. You ready? Oh. You're going to do it. Maybe. 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 All right, let's continue on. 
Michelle, whenever you're ready. All righty. So SAB or Student Advisory Board, uh, unfortunately, to this notice, we had to cancel our December meeting. Uh, we will have to reconstruct our next meeting to make up for lost time. But I am excited to start the process of finding my president elect or the person who will uh, kind of mentor under me for the next couple of months and then take my position when I graduate in May. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, January 17th at 8.15 a.m. And then I also wanted to give a shout out to all the schools and students that participated in this year's Polar Plunge. It was a huge success and a great way for students to be a part of the community. And good luck to anyone and everyone taking finals this week. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. Shaw? All righty, thank you. Oh, okay, he hit, that's a private question there. All right, moving on, we have uh, two uh, reports um, under, that's uh, actually not on the agenda, but we have two reports um, from one from the Teamsters and one from Local 71. Member Jacobs, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so first, the, a letter from Local 71 uh, directed to uh, ASD. Um, the letter is addressed to Mr. Tiford. Um, the letter was written 11-21-22. States, Mr. Tiford, this letter is to serve as official notice that it is public 70, uh, public employees, Local 71, uh, or the union's intent to request to meet with you and your negotiating team at your convenience to discuss and schedule future negotiation sessions. This request is to keep in compliance with CBA language Article 17, Section 1 of the Collective Bargaining Agreement between ASD and Local 71. Please contact Business Manager Secretary Treasurer Jordan Adams uh, to schedule our initial meet and greet meeting. Thank you sincerely, William Mears, Business Representative. Thank you. And the, and the second, second letter is uh, from Teamsters Local 959, uh, directed to Mr. Andrew Sunbroom, dated 11-30-22. Uh, Dear Andrew, pursuant to the terms of our collective bargaining agreement, kindly accept this as sufficient notification of Teamsters Local 959's desire to open the collective bargaining agreement for the processes of review and or amending all articles. Uh, appendices, supplements, addenda, and or letters of understanding of such agreement. Teamsters Un Local 959 will be negotiating a collective bargaining agreement with your company that may affect area and industrial standards as well as other Teamster members. The Public Service Division, affiliated with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and Joint Council of Teamsters Number 28, have a constitutional responsibility to assure that their affiliates preserve and protect area and industry standards and do not take any action that adversely affects the interest of any Teamster members. Consequently, any proposed collective bargaining agreement with your company must be review reviewed and approved by the Joint Council and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters Trade Division prior to being submitted to affected members for ratification. This approval process shall not delay reaching an appropriate agreement. Please contact business representative Derek Musto to schedule a date and time. Your representative will be available to meet. Thank you, Member Jacobs. Uh, it is uh, part of our process to read those uh, ready to negotiate uh, letters or whatever we call them uh, into the record so that the records show that Teamsters 959 and Local 71 have issued uh, letters of, uh, what, do I, what do I call that, negotiation? Intent to negotiate, that's what it is, thank you. All right, um, this brings us now to item C, our goal monitoring conversation. Tonight's conversation is around the Alaska Star reading and math. At our last meeting, we were given uh, reports. Uh, those members, board members who had questions did send them in. So thank you for that. Um, but we're now going to have the conversation. Uh, we will have two conversations tonight, starting with the reading proficiency. Um, and then we will follow with the math proficiency. Uh, so we have uh, the reading goal number one and our math goal uh, uh, number one. Our reading goal, uh, as you can, I don't know if it's going to come up on the screen, but beginning in September 2020, the percentage of third grade students proficient in reading on the state summative test uh, current, it formerly peaks. 
will increase from 40% to 80% by May 2026. As you know, the Alaska STAR uh, exam is new. It's a new assessment. Uh, we are still uh, part of the, tonight's conversation is to better understand that um, assessment tool. We have, we have uh, one set of data from that tool. Our math proficiency goal um, is to, uh, beginning September 2020. The percentage of students in grades three through nine proficient in mathematics on the state summative assessment, formerly PEAKS, will increase from 40% to 55% by May of 2026. Before we begin, I'd like to confirm that all of the com four components of the monitoring reports are present. The report clearly shows uh, what is being monitored um, and that uh, its focus is on a specific goal. The report also shows three previous reporting periods, uh, keeping in mind that this is a new assessment, so we want we the previous uh, information or data will be from peaks, not from the Alaska Star. Um, and and to further clarify, the Alaska Star is not. I mean, this is a state required assessment. It is not something the district can opt in or opt out of. The report shows the superintendent's value. Uh, I'm sorry, evaluation of performance. And fourthly. <clears throat> the report shows supporting documentation that evidences the superintendent's evaluation uh, via table, the tables provided, and it shows next steps. So with all components present, we'd like to begin our conversation. Um, and so as, as usual, we start with our who, what's, and why's category questions, and then we move into our how. Uh, so uh, at this point, I would like to um, open the floor for questions uh, regarding reading, the reading goal. And once we've done that one, we will go into the math. Dr. Bryant. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to the board's questions. I want to recognize the academic services leadership team who will also be participating in this conversation to answer questions on the who, what, and the next steps. Questions from the board? Member Jacobs, I see your uh, mic's on. Is that a mistake? I just didn't turn it off. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I think uh, one of my, my pressing question is around the difference between the Alaska Star and Peaks. And I mean, there you know, the, the data that we've gotten shows that we are lower than expected, but higher than most statewide. Um, so what what is what accounts for the difference in the, in the two instruments, the two assessment tools? I'll, I'll attempt to do that. <laughs> um, so there, as far as the test goes, there wasn't a change in the test format, really. What it was was a change in the design of the test. And so, you know, there's many different types of and many different reasons why proficiency levels would be different throughout the year, um, especially once you go from one to the other. Um, but there's definitely uh, there's definitely some changes there. Um, what we're looking at, you know, of course, is going and looking at our science of reading um, curriculum and making sure that we're teaching that with fidelity to actually increase our results for a second year of the STAR. Um, Eric or Diana, would you like to add on any, anything for that? Did I answer your question, Ms. Bellamy? Uh, I, I think so, I, I'll have a follow-up. So if, Eric, did you? I was gonna I, say. I'm sorry, you guys introduce yourselves when you speak. Oh, I should have done that, I'm So sorry. I'm Sven Gustafson, I'm Thank the you. Chief Academic Officer. Thank you. And I'll, I'll add for you a little bit. It was Eric Visti, Senior Director for Elementary Education. Um, one of the pieces with the Alaska STAR is um, in, in that it's connected with our MAP growth assessment. So our MAP growth assessment with through NWA produced the Alaska STAR. So what we're hoping to see come out of the Alaska STAR is a higher level of predictiveness with uh, the MAP testing, which will give us a little bit more uh, ability to prognose and dial into our MTSS structures in winter and in fall when we see students fall at a different risk level. Um, and so we can, that's what we're looking towards. Now we're, we just completed the first Alaska STAR. So we wanna see how that works out, but we're looking really um, optimistic in terms of our increased capacity with the Alaska STAR versus the peaks. 
uh, other questions um, that, yeah, member uh, lessons. Sure, and I um, I think I have an understanding of that it was just data error, but maybe it begs um, clarification that should the projection is on slide five for grade three AK star proficiency read 45% instead of, it does yes. now. Yeah, okay. it does now. That was a mistake and you okay. caught that for us. So thank okay. you. Great. Um, and I guess one of the questions that I have is um, given uh, the note at the bottom of this slide that right now we're showing a projected 29% proficiency rate and that is a little bit lower than our target. Um, what's your understanding of where we're at? Do you Are you seeing growth that would um, get us closer to the target? And I'll go ahead and get us started and then I'll let the team chime in. But again, one of the benefits of the Alaska Star is the ability to have these projections. Mm -hmm. So a teacher will be able to use this data and then adjust their day-to-day -day instruction based on these projections and take action that could result in greater proficiency. Um, I do think that it's a major, um, you know, raise, it rings the alarm bells when you see that we're on track for 29% projection. And that's why we need to really lean in on our MTSS and other strategies to um, adjust and improve um, instruction and supports for students. So I'll let my colleagues chime in. That's what I was going to say too, is this is, it's like goal setting. When you know where you're at and you know where you want to be, you set some goals. It's almost working with each individual kiddo and figuring out where they are and move them forward. And if we can tell that early on in the year, we can put those structures and supports in place and be able to move them forward. So yeah, we're pretty confident we're going to, we, we we are very hopeful that we'll be going to be able to make the 35%. Okay, very good. Member Donnelly. Thank you, Madam President. Do we know in third grade, what percentage of our classrooms are currently fully utilizing our current reading curriculum? No. To give you some context, back in 2020, we had a report, um, we had, or it had somebody in go to over 50 classrooms. And the report was that less than 30% of them would fully implemented the existing reading curriculum. You know, over the years, I do know that we added things into the Cengage curriculum to allow teachers to have more tools over the time frame. And um, as we're going through and as teachers become more comfortable, they're actually utilizing the curriculum more. Um, Mr. Visti or Ms. Beltran, do you have any other information? And I do know that none of you were here two years ago, three years ago. So we know we, you may not have the answer. If not, we can, we can, you can get it to us later. Yeah, okay. we can. Work that on question that. didn't come in early. But if you have something to add to it, that would be, feel free to. Hi, Diana Beltran. I'm senior director of teaching and learning. Um, I don't have any, I, we don't have that answer yet. We can get it to you. We do do. We have conducted um, implementation snapshots, but it wasn't specific to third grade. And um, I don't, I don't want to give you an incorrect answer, but we did. It was a gauge in in so many classrooms to see not just who's using the curriculum, but utilizing the the science of reading strategies and so forth. But specific to third grade, I don't have that for you. We can. We would have to conduct, we would have to do a snapshot and go into classrooms to actually see how many third grade classrooms are actually using the curriculum. Did you want for third grade or for all grades, Member Don? Well, basically the testing's in third grade and yes. third grade's so crucial. We've yeah. all pretty much accepted the fact that we need our kiddos to be reading well to proficient level by third grade to have a very significant impact on the rest of their academic careers. So even if it was just third grade, it'd be advantageous. Additionally, at the time that we got that report, we were told that there was a, a clear correlation between the uh, success in individual classrooms for reading um, between the ones that were implementing the new curriculum and the, and, and the ones that hadn't, that it was a very positive uh, um, correlation between the utilization of the new curriculum versus the the teachers that had chosen not to use it. And, and again, you guys can get back to us on that. If you, I, I made a note to, uh, so we don't lose it. Other questions on reading, specifically on reading, member lessons. 
this was a question that was really beyond the scope of the data presented here, but I think it has bearing on the end game, the, on the goal. And um, since this current goal, or maybe a potentially revised goal, speaks to third graders in 2026, that's this year's kindergarten students. That's this cohort. And according to data shared with the board earlier this fall, they came into our schools with short, with shortfalls in print, uh, concepts of print, onset sounds, letter names, um, letter sounds um, to a, a, a greater magnitude than their counterparts a year before. So I guess one question I have is how, how, do, how are our kindergartners doing now? And I know that there's sort of fall and then winter assessments and things have been disrupted by, by, by snow days. Um, but are we seeing, again, any interesting areas of growth for this year's kindergartners who will be our third graders in this particular goal? So, of course, there's many different ways we're assessing kids. Right now, we're in the middle, we're still in the window of the winter testing. And upcoming, once we get those results, it's actually going to be reported in another interim goal through these outcome monitoring. So, we, right now, we don't have an answer for that, but we will later during the next another round of this. So, what would be a realistic cycle for? We've already had one Alaska star, right? When do we? It, we've only taken it once. Yes. So we'll take it again. When when do we take it again? Uh, I thought I saw it. In the spring? In April, I believe. Okay. So then um, when do we take, how does the map fit? So, so one thing that we've done, you know, we've had all these talks about over testing and stuff. Since the STAR is an NWEA, this, this mm -hmm. year we've taken away that last map when we're using the STAR as the last test for the year. Mm -hmm. um, the last round of, of the of the three areas, okay. the three times. So um, that's kind of how where that goes. All right. So we're only going to be doing the map twice and the Alaska Star once. Yes. yes. That's it. Yep. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. For, for third grade. For yes, through, yes. third through okay. ninth. And please correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that that third map or that Alaska Star will provide the projection similar so, to yes. the map, so we so, don't okay. lose the data to help inform instruction okay. going right. into next year. Okay. Right. That's true. All right. And I guess my next question may be for Dr. Bryant. Can you just give us a high level overview of the um, Alaska Literacy Act and how that applies to our work in this district? Sure. Uh, the Alaska Reads Act um, really triggered a cascade of changes at the state level, including an incentive program to incentivize more districts to choose uh, a smaller set of curriculum. I think um, from the state's perspective, there's a lot of variance in, in terms of the types of curriculum that are happening across the state. And this provides an incentive to really narrow that down to four or fewer different types of curriculum. So that way it's easier to support districts like ASD and others across the state. So for that reason, Reason, I found it prudent to submit a letter of interest um, to the state to just understand what would ASD be eligible for in terms of financial incentive. And that is not a decision point. That would be a conversation at the board level if we did want to adjust the ELA curriculum off cycle. But it, I think it's a compelling opportunity worth reviewing. And we're currently in that process. So I'm fairly confident that um, this time at our next board meeting, I'll have more concrete steps and a recommendation for how to proceed. Um, but internally, we're still deliberating reading how this factors into the K3 um, strategy for reading implementation curriculum. So how, are, how are we? Um, so do we have somebody working with the state? Do I, what, I Correct. So um, we formed a panel uh, of staff members and others, and you can go more into the specifics, but essentially playing a role in deciding what are those four curriculums going to be so that way we know what we could leverage that incentive money for should we want to take them up on that offer. And again, that decision has not been made, um, but the deadline to apply for that incentive was uh, several months ago, I believe. And had we not expressed interest, we wouldn't have been eligible. So at least now we have the opportunity to make that decision as a board. And we do have participation in the process. Correct. You can clarify that. Yes. Please. So the first committee did include um, a cross section of people for actually helping the state come out, come down from seven different curriculums to four. And um, that group was pr really involved with coming up with the four. There will be a much more robust, if we, robust um, group to look at the overall curriculums if we choose to move forward. Okay. Just so we're tracking it as a district it, that that really was my question to make sure we weren't missing an opportunity that might help this goal 
Okay, I think uh, anybody else before I ask? My, yes, Member Jacobs. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Um, the comparison to the the other Big Five districts was interesting. Um, it looks like that was for the first time since at least 2018. What page is that? Um, the last one. Yeah, the two comparison slides. I think they've got it up yeah. there. Um, since at least 2018, Anchorage is leading the pack of the large five for the first time. I was curious if anyone had data as to how long that streak went back prior to 2018 or if that was. I would not. Know. I, I'm only aware of, of this data set from 2018, but it is an important slide because this underscores that the switch to an assessment caused um, a statewide ripple effect where districts across the state um, also saw lower levels of proficiency, and that is partly due to the difference in design of the assessment. So I think that makes a compelling case for why the board will need to consider um, perhaps adjusting the, the baseline moving forward as well as the goals because of that sharp drop across the state that um, also resulted in Anchorage being at the top of the big five, but you can see the ripple effect for you know nearly 60% of the students in the state. Okay, thank you. That, that was one of my questions as well. Thank you. Um, Member Lessons, did you have another? I, I can keep going. Um, one of the questions, again, this is beyond the scope of the data presented here, but everything's connected. And if our students aren't attending school, they're not learning. What, if any bearing, does chronic absenteeism and our attendance rates um, do, do our attendance rates have on, on these scores, on our goals? How can we improve that, the problem of chronic absenteeism, which I think is fairly acute? Was that on your list? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing a question okay. that I presented already. That you presented, okay. I'll, I'll say at, at a high level and then I'll allow the academic experts to also chime in. Absenteeism needs to be a core part of an academic turnaround strategy. To your point, I completely agree that if students are not in school, it's going to be really difficult to get them up to our ambitious goals of proficiency. And I would say even going beyond that, we also need to ensure that we have great teachers in all of our classrooms and minimizing vacancies um, and shortages for support staff at all comes together in one giant puzzle and curriculum is just one piece of how we achieve um, student proficiency. So I'll, I'll let my colleagues uh, add any additional color to that. I, I would just echo what Dr. Bryant said, you know, attendance is a, definitely a key and that's something um, we all focus on and we're just trying to make sure we're having those parent outreach activities and, and talks, you know, um, Eric, do you have anything at the elementary level? Yeah, I'd say part of our collaborative problem solving teams, when you get into chronic absenteeism versus absenteeism, our, our student problem solving teams is where school, uh, uh, multiple groups of people, teachers, specialists, principal, are problem solving individual circumstances, because a lot of times those chronic absenteeisms are specific to families in particular. And so usually they provide and you need unique um, unique problem solving to be able to identify how to help students booster that. But parent engagement, attendance is always a priority in our schools. Um, and we're going to continue to work on that. Follow up? Yes. Yeah. So we have a data dashboard on attendance rates, and that's essentially a chronic absenteeism data dashboard, right? Because it's 90% of our students. And is that how we would define chronic absenteeism is 90% of the students who attend 90% of the time? I'm sorry, this is beyond the scope of this particular session handy but I'll allow uh, my colleagues to turn on the official definition, definition handy either um our goal is 90 percent right and anything under that is uh of concern of course there's also there's so many different reasons why kids are absent there's so many different ways that kids can catch up and actually gain some of the instruction that they have still so we have to be real careful about what we look at and we're talking about absenteeism especially now especially like in sixth through 12th grade where they can get on canvas shells and actually get the work right so um so we there's so many different particular things that has to do with absenteeism that we you know every, each individual school with their principals and their counselors and their support teams really looking at the specific kiddos that are really chronic um, with their absenteeism so I guess uh, I know we can't there, and a lot of that is beyond what the school can deal with right parents either will choose to send their kids to school or they choose to take them on vacation. They choose to in, to do whatever they do. That's their right. Um, 
I'm, I'm just thinking what kinds of, and this is probably another conversation, uh, but what we're doing some things right now in our schools to um, mitigate, to get kids to school. And I think it, it probably looks different elementary, middle and high school. So I, you know, I don't want people thinking we're not doing anything and we're just ignoring when kids are not in school. We notice uh, and there are things that are being done. So I'm not asking a question. I just wanted to make sure that people understood that, you know, attendance is not, we can't control it, but it is important to student growth. Uh, if they're not in school, I agree, they cannot learn. Uh, so I guess how do we, and, and, and another future conversation is what are we doing to change that, to, to make education, to help parents be able to get their kids to school, if that's necessary. I mean, if that's, if, 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 if it's a, you know, when we're closed, we're closed, but when the, you know, when parents choose to take kids on vacation and not be in school, do we allow makeup? So they may be chronic, they may be absent X number of days, but they did all the makeup work. So it's a big, I just think it's a bigger picture than just looking at butts and seats. Mm -hmm. Number lessons. Yeah, I just, you know, when I pull up the data dashboard this year, we've got 54% of our kindergartners with 90% attendance or more. That's terrible. And I don't know what to do with that. Our kids aren't yeah, going to learn their decoding but, skills if they're not in school. True. And that's what we have to impress upon parents, I think, because we can't make them come to school, but we can love them when they get there. So I don't know. At some point, we're going to have to have that conversation or or at least tell us what what's uh, enlighten us as to what's happening, you know, when we notice a kid is chronically absent. Because um, that real that that's part of our how, I guess. I don't know where it fits, but um, I think it's a separate conversation. But I also think it's maybe a little bit of apples and oranges because we can't control that piece. Any other questions? Remember, uh, Higgins, you got your mic on. Yeah, just on the attendance issue, the virtual learning, how is that impacting or has it imp favorably impacted the attendance issues where you can do things virtually and how that has played out? If anything, do we know numbers with that of how much people might depend upon that? I, I don't believe we have any data to look into that. Uh, Member Higgins, I, it's, it's an individual based thing. Um, and so when a student's absent, we wouldn't know at this level whether or not they're accessing it or not. Okay. I, I, I saw that, you know, I mean, obviously other school districts closed because of snow, other things like that. You know, the, the illnesses, the flus out there, everything else is going on. And some people may be reliant. Upon you know, that. I think that teachers are inherently wanting to help those kids that are absent and sick and out of their classrooms, right? And so I think yeah. that they're constantly giving them opportunities to be able to make up any work that they miss when they're absent and they're more than happy to do so. We're looking at, um, you know, trying to get the kids in and welcome them. If, if they make up the work, does that alter the attendance records? No, attendance records are attendance records. Yeah. Remember this? This is a bigger picture, but you know, when we, we talk about accountability, yeah. I think it's really hard to maintain educational integrity when families are not getting their children to school for whatever reason. And, and I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Yeah, it's that's, just, uh, that's a challenge. It is the way it is. And it's a challenge. Not that we can't. I, I bet you schools are doing some amazing things. Uh, although that's not the topic of this conversation tonight. We'll bring it back up because I do, I agree. And I'm thinking for maybe for our retreat, we could have a little more in-depth discussion, uh, especially when we're looking at changing our goals. We won't change them in January, but in June, we would be looking to make those changes. So, and that's a conversation we probably should have. Any, any other conversations um, around the reading goal? I, I did have one final uh, clarification, if, if you could. On page six, um, we we uh, what what was uh, and I think I, t I did talk to Kathy a uh, uh, side conversation with um, Miss Moffat on the um, rationale for the new target. So this this is just a suggestion. Is that correct? 
It is not, the Cor board has not made a. Correct. We were really just underscoring that because of the change in baseline across the state, that this could be an opportunity for the board to decide to set this year as the new baseline, just given the drastic difference between what was considered proficient with the previous exam and the AK star. That's um, not a decision um, that the administration has made, but we did want to show you theoretically what could different targets look like if we want to maintain the same percentage point increase of 40 points. Okay. Uh, Member Donnelly, that was one of your questions the last time. Um, so we, we're, we are going to revisit our goals, uh, probably not for January, but for June, so that we could reset. And so this 65% is a um, uh, just a, a suggestion. Or just a scenario, a multiple scenario. scenarios <laughs> that can be considered at the will of the board, just okay, to be clear. A scenario. Okay. Seeing or hearing no more questions on reading, do we still have you guys for math? Mm -hmm. All right, okay. So let's move to math. Uh, who's got questions on our math report? Uh, it looked a little different than, um, looks like our kids did better. <clears throat> well, not as, not as good. Go on. Yeah, I was curious about why the, our fifth to seventh graders seems to have demonstrated more resiliency than their younger or older counterparts. They seem to have been less negatively impacted by the structure of the new exam. When you look at a bit of a bit of a bell curve there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would the team like to give insight? Sure. Um, uh, the, the as as um, Mr. Gustafson said, the the format ne didn't necessarily change, but the but the design what was changed in the in the in the test. Um, Can you tell us what that means when you say the design changed? Is it the makeup of the questions? The, the well, it was it was changed through, um, and I'd, I'd have to defer to our A and E department in terms of what exactly the the science of that all gets into. Mm -hmm. um, but the format of it was still provided online, online format and that, but the nature of how the te all the test questions were created and, and brought to the students was a change in previously from the peaks assessment. So, um, and, and just to add as well, you know, every time a new assessment is created, there have to be conversations around what the new cut score is, and that could impact the, the, the way in which scales are distributed across the state. There are a lot of decisions that had to be made internally at the state level that resulted in the scores that we saw. And on top of that, um, MAP itself is more adaptive in nature, um, and the testing experience is different um, for each individual student. So there are a number of factors that may have resulted in different capacities to, to what we see um, in the data. Okay, appreciate that. Other questions for math? Um, yeah, okay. Looks like it's, we're going to volley. Sorry, Why okay. Um, so with the new scores, we have the, I don't know if you call them RIT or RIT scores. Can we harness them in some way? I mean, we have, there's a, a metric for proficiency, but then you're also given these, the sort of growth range. And maybe you could talk about the difference between the cut score and the, the RIT score. Mm. Right, because those are sort of different but complementary data sets. So I would uh, go ahead, Dr. Bell. Well, I was just going to, so the RIT score is something at the school level that we look at so that we can take that uh, score and determine what the student needs to help them move forward. But for the purpose of the board or for progress monitoring, we're looking at the overall score for proficiency. So at the school level, um, we do look, especially with the um, the collaborative problem solving team that Eric referred to earlier will look at those RIT scores and and then determine what do students need individually um, and also instructionally. So it's a way a teacher can look at the RIT score to determine how to move instruction forward. But the scores that you're looking at is kind of like that 30 foot view of our overall scores. Any other uh, questions regarding either reading or math? I think we have 
Did you have any final comments, Dr. Bryant? before we end our conversation? Uh, no, um, thank you to the academic services leadership team. Um, we've had some new faces join um, the, the department over the last several months, and then we'll be joined by our new senior director of evaluation going into next semester. So I truly think that we have a strong team that can help um, spearhead a sound academic strategy moving forward. So thank you. Thank you guys very much. Okay, and this brings us to item D on our uh, agenda. Uh, and this is our first round hour of uh, public comment. Lost my, my uh, note. So the board has set aside a one hour time slot in the beginning of our meeting. Um, for the purpose of public comment. The public may comment on anything that's of interest to them, including items on the agenda. This is the public's time to speak and the board's time to listen. Uh, um, we welcome uh, the public to observe and continue uh, or contribute, I'm sorry, to our meetings uh, through comments, uh, but to be productive, our meetings must be structured and civil. So as you came into the boardroom, there is a blue and white sheet at the door that pretty much explains uh, the behavior and de uh, decorum that we expect to have in the boardroom. Uh, speakers may point out what he or she believes to be a natural consequence of a board action, but may not engage in speech that personally attack others. Ref uh, no cheering, applause, or outbursts. Attendees will not be permitted to interrupt the business of the board. Uh, no profanity or foul language, no waving of signs, flyers, or posters. If you have handouts, we will gladly distribute them. Just give them to Amanda. She's seated here to my left. Um, the only other uh, couple of items would be uh, no disturbance or according to our policy. Uh, no disturbance or willful interruption of any board meeting will be permitted persistent with persistence by an individual or group shall be grounds for the chair to terminate the privilege of addressing the meeting. The school board may remove disruptive individuals and order the room cleared if necessary. No oral presentation uh, shall inc include charges or complaints against any employee of the school board of the school board including the superintendent, regardless of whether or not the employee is identified by name or by another resource that tends to, uh, which tends to identify. Charges or complaints against employees must be submitted to the school board under the provisions of school board policy and administrative regulations. Uh, the school board president has a duty to enforce these uh, rules of civility and decorum as such, speakers may be ruled out of order for violation of these rules. Anyone who does not adhere to these rules and fails to conduct themselves in a civil manner may be removed from the meeting. So with those guidelines um, and for the that are in place for the comfort of everyone, we will begin our public comment period. Do you have at least my list? Okay. 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 Our first one uh, via phone, Danielle Kemp. He, there's no one online, so but, uh, I'll check back. Let's have uh, Krista Sandhofner and Jessica Lowers. If you'll come forward, please. And welcome, each speaker will have three minutes. Please state your name and you'll have your three minutes will start. My name is Krista Sanofner and I've been a teacher in the district for 18 years, 16 of them at CLAT. First, I would like to acknowledge the school board members who have spent many hours learning about the six schools that were proposed to close next year. Since receiving this news over two months ago, we have taken on a tremendous amount of unnecessary stress. Employees, ASD families, our personal families, and most importantly, our students. 
As I reflected over this time to find the positives, I'm grateful for showing my students how to advocate for themselves, teaching my daughter to speak up for what is right, creating an even closer school staff and family, at the same time staying focused on our students. We are exhausted and overwhelmed with emotions, confident that the added exhaustion and sicknesses that we have all experienced the past few months has made us more in tune to what really has been going on behind the scenes within the school district throughout the past five plus years. A feeling of relief followed by uneasiness sums up the overall mood of a majority of district employees. What will families, employees, and students quote unquote lose sleep over next? The biggest question is, will the district continue to collaborate with the employees and communities that spend the most time directly working with students on a daily basis? The word that seems to keep coming up is efficient. Collaboration with the people that are in the schools and communities seems the most logical and efficient use of resources. Will the district continue to hire out-of-state consultants rather than utilize the resources right in front of them? As employees in the district, can we trust that the decisions being made are truly the most efficient and thought out? My hope, and I can only assume most others feel the same, is that as a district, teachers, staff, and head administration can get back to the cohesiveness we once experienced under Carol Como and Ed Graff. 15 plus years ago, the unity among the district was solid, and we did not feel a sense of division among schools and administration. According to the ASD homepage, student learning achievement and lifelong successes are the focus of the Anchorage School District. Equitable access and opportunity are keys to building a successful learning path for each student. ASD celebrates our differences and is committed to inclusion of all our communities, languages, cultures, and perspectives. If this is what the district truly believes, then collaboration at all levels needs to continue in a positive direction. Creating an environment where our voices are actually heard and collaboration is crucial. Examples of this include, while I piloted a math program a few years ago before adopting the current one, my feedback and many others was that with such a diverse population, we should adopt a less reading heavy curriculum. Did that happen? Are you aware that our six through eight springboard curriculum does not have a Spanish version available to us? I spent months last year trying to track one down last year for a sixth grade monolingual and finally translated pages myself. When talking about AK star, Tess, do you know about the glitches that occurred and misgiven information to test proctors so much that the test was put on hold? Before the school year began, I called transportation and questioned how one bus at Diamond Estates and two different cohorts would work. And the response, we will look into that. Again, unnecessary stress, time, and energy that could have been alleviated if there was some sort of collaboration between ASD school staff and community members. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Elizabeth Hunt to come forward, please. Jessica, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jessica Lowers, the parent of two Clatt Elementary children and the Clatt PTA president. I want to offer you my sincere gratitude for the time, attention, and care that you've extended to the recommended school closure conversation and the budget shortfall over the last few months. I am greatly encouraged while very aware that there remains a long road ahead in balancing the budget and finding long-term financial sustainability. So as the district continues to move forward with the final school closure decision at hand and in continued efforts to address the budget shortfall, I'd like to ask for a prioritization of equity, community engagement, and clear communication. Equity, please prioritize equity in determining the criteria for recommendations and decisions being made to ensure that our economically vulnerable and diverse communities aren't inordinately impacted. Community engagement. Please prioritize community participation in district decision making at all levels and the development of guiding criteria for major impact decisions like closing schools in identifying solutions and communicating those possibilities and in the development and identification of those solutions. Clear communication. Please prioritize clear communication that is accessible to all families, regardless of language or access to technology, so that the final decisions of the board in regard to the school closures are understood and it doesn't impact enrollment. Transparency is part of clear communication. It is imperative that our entire community is completely informed by the impact of future recommendations and decisions. In the future, it is important that the community understand not just the potential positive outcomes of district recommendations, changes, and decisions, but also the potential risks and harmful effects of hard decisions such as these. I also ask that any decisions that impact student learning and opportunity are passed with measures put in place to keep track of that impact on student outcomes for all students, but particularly if any students are displaced. Thank you for your dedicated service and your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David Northrup, would you join us, please? 
Elizabeth, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Elizabeth Hunt, and I wear concert black tonight out of respect for the musical tradition and also in honor of all of my musical colleagues. I started studying violin in fourth grade at Chugach Optional. My musical studies continued through college. I went on to teach classroom music in Anchorage School District for 17 years. I have served on the board of directors for the Anchorage Symphony Orchestra for seven years. The foundational experiences that I gained through instrumental music in elementary school have been definitive in my life, my career path. They have impacted my students, my family, and my community. ASD has a long-standing tradition of a robust fine arts department. The fine arts department organizes countless performances, festivals, music in our schools month activities, concerts in this building, and also the daily instruction of thousands of students in classroom music, instrumental, and choral music. As you know, in the fine arts, students enrich their problem-solving abilities, seek and create beauty, explore new ideas and perspectives, and access brain functions that are unique to these disciplines. It is indisputable that students who participate in the arts show higher test results on standardized tests and are seen as more desirable by employers in the 21st century. This brings me to the sobering focus of my testimony tonight. The elimination of sixth grade band and orchestra has been a proposed way to span the budget deficit. I know that you've heard many others testify on this subject and I beseech you to, to continue uh, band and orchestra as it is currently funded. Our students cannot become creative innovators, well-rounded scholars with a diminished exposure to music. Art and music are the reasons that many students come to school and stay in school. As was mentioned, we are facing post-pandemic challenges with attendance and achievement. Doesn't it make sense to provide classes which bring students to school? Students gain confidence, vocabulary, coping mechanisms, and higher order thinking through the arts. The arts are the only discipline that provide benefit to every other subject area. Please consider the ramifications of eliminating sixth grade band and orchestra. Our high school musical ensembles in three short years are decimated. Students will have chosen other options for electives and will not have the interest or preparation to join high school music. And then we will extinguish the potential to raise up future Anchorage Symphony members and homegrown music educators. Students will be stifled in their creative possibilities. They will not be able to make cross-curricular connections so valuable in the arts. I must reference our school district's motto, educating all students for success in life. We are charged to provide the best educational opportunities possible across all content areas. Our students and our community are counting on us to do so. If students are given diminished access to instrumental music curriculum, we fall short of this objective. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Mm, thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Mary Cruson to the microphone, please. David, whenever you're ready. Hey there, my name's Dave Northup. And um, first I wanna thank the board. Um, I didn't get a chance to see today's work session, but I did listen and watch um, the work session on Saturday. And I will give props, that was a clever exercise that I think really helps you guys understand the uh, budget and the impacts of some of the decisions you're making. So first and foremost, a thank you to the board on um, that the, the process that ASD and the board's gone through seems to have worked. Um, we appreciate your listening, your thoughtful deliberation and the countless hours that you've spent deliberating this uh, budget crisis. Um, so that's my main thing um, is to say thank you for that. Uh, as you've learned over nine, I think nine town halls and various uh, other testimony, that's important not to close these schools uh, this year. There's obviously a lot of things that maybe weren't thought of or should have been thought of in going forward. Hopefully there's a better process to deal with that. Um, as you go forward, if there's a community task force that can work with the board um, to understand the impacts of closing schools, because um, as been mentioned many times, it kind of is an inevitability with declined enrollment, but using the community to find um, efficiencies instead of just, you know, springing it basically on the public and creating what was probably tens of thousands of people losing sleep and working and thinking about it. Um, but when you do have that conversation, hopefully the public will be involved in, as it was said earlier, hopefully it can be done in an equitable manner. Um, 
Regarding the administration, um, ASD, hopefully this has been a kind of a, a learning opportunity. Um, it's been as described and as you well know, painful for a lot of families, painful for a lot of staff, but especially painful for a lot of students. You've had probably hundreds of students come up, you know, fear that they're gonna lose something important to their life. So hopefully um, in the future, this process could start a little sooner a little more inclusive of the community and the stakeholders and have a little bit more um, um, thought put to it. It seems like, um, you know, in September, October, we got, um, you know, told the schools were going to close, which the savings represented about 10% of the budget, but we really didn't hear anything else about any other part of the budget. Some of the first time I heard it was in the um, Saturday work session. So hopefully that can be done. And the community needs to also be involved. It's well point that, you know, we need to look to Juno and try to get the BSA tied to uh, inflation. And it really starts with um, the community members, collectively the students putting that same energy towards Juno so we don't have to be in this position again. So again, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, again invite Mary Krusen Joel and uh, Terrence Dalton. What about Joel Potter? And Nancy Bale. Joel Potter and Nancy Bale. Welcome, you have three minutes. Thank you for your time this evening. I'm here to ask the board and district leadership to revisit what went wrong with the school closure plans this fall so that these problems are not perpetuated in a vote to close Abbott Loop Elementary. I also wish to encourage Superintendent Bryant and the board to take this opportunity for a reset in the district's approach. Long before the district publicly endorsed the closure of six schools, an equity study should have been conducted to evaluate the proposal. It would have shown that on the whole, the plan favored well-off students at charters at the expense of economically disadvantaged students and their families. If there had been robust community involvement at the development stage, criteria emphasizing the importance of equity, walkability, belonging, and stability would have helped to lead the district towards solutions that did not suffer from the sort of community backlash you saw this fall. By focusing on building utilization rates, the district reinforced a narrow and politically motivated view of efficiency. In addition, the district reinforced the misperception that consolidation is a reliable route to long-term savings. Now it has an uphill battle to disassociate itself from such rhetoric and find a new way forward. Damage has already been done to six schools and their communities. It wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see a drop in enrollment at the schools as parents are still uncertain about what will happen. Because of these missteps over two months, the district needs to rebuild trust. The first way to do this is to make it absolutely clear to staff and parents that their schools are off the closure list. For Abbott Loop or any other school that may still be under consideration for closure next year, at a bare minimum prior to any vote to close, I ask the board to require the following three things. First, a complete breakdown of the savings to be achieved for each of the next five years. This inf information should be publicly available and should specify all reductions in expenditures, impacts on revenue, and new costs of consolidation. Second, a thorough equity study. And third, a board resolution requiring the district to provide an annual review for at least five years of the success or failure of the specific closure both academically and relative to the original savings projection. Finally, I urge the board to use this opportunity to reset and pursue a better way forward. This involves applying an equity lens to all planning and decision-making, including the decision this evening about whether to devote 37 million in unrestricted funds to rebuild and let view elementary. This way prioritizes community participation. This way, looks for infrastructure solutions that promote equity and this way seeks to foster community support for every single school in the district by for example supporting the creation of community and alumni associations at schools that lack ptas thank you very much next uh nancy bale yarrow silvers olivia cullen 
Cologne, Cologne. Is Elizabeth here? Okay. Olivia, yes. And if I can have Misty Nelson come forward, please. Welcome, you have uh, three minutes. You can have a seat. And that mic, your mic is on, just pull it towards your mouth. Hello, so um, for today, I'd like to just address a couple of concerns in this time. Uh, one in particular was raised at a more recent previous school board meeting. Okay, can you put it, speak into the mic, please? Yes. Thank you. I think that's better. Um, one of those two concerns I'd wanted to I wanted to bring up tonight is um, in regards to books that are inappropriate in the school libraries that are being checked out by students. And I went back to see if it had been addressed through the school board, through the memos, agendas, and whatnot. But I'd seen that that portion is not there. So I wanted to inquire about that. What happened with that complaint? Um, it's not uh, accessible anymore on the document or in that YouTube clip. I went back to try to find it to find the mark and it was gone. So that was one thing I was going to mention to see if those books had yet been removed, if this had yet been addressed. To add to that, is it possible uh, for ASD to put on the ASD website a link per school with inventory of all the books available in the library so parents can see what books the, our children are accessing to see for ourselves what is appropriate and inappropriate and ensure that only appropriate material is accessible by our, by our kids? That was one of the concerns. The other concern was the mention about um, trying to incorporate mental health in the near future, possibly. Uh, from that presentation, there, there were actually a lot more questions than answers provided in that presentation. And a lot of them were questionable, but also concerning. And just some of the many questions that I, that I had in regards to that is um, how the goal is to save money. But how would that even work if some of these children's diagnoses required long-term treatment when there is school is not in session outside of hours? How would you maintain confidentiality if their peers are seeing them being taken by counselors or whatnot, already alerting that there's something present? So I don't see how that would happen. But more concerning is that's the lane of parents to determine what mental health care are, is appropriate for their children. That's absolutely not in the lane of diagnosis or diagnostic treatment. Wouldn't that then follow the student? <clears throat> Should they then want to go to college? The universities can access these records that could show some bias from some kind. Thank you very much. Uh, your time is up. Um, next, we have, uh, let, let me invite Marnie Hartill to um to join us and olivia um if you will send we do not engage in back and forth during the meeting but if you will uh if you could email your concerns we will get you answers or put you in touch with the people who can give you answers i have emailed i emailed every single person on the board with those questions i emailed you specifically regarding the mental health situation and questions concerns um, I've cc'd all of you. I hadn't had anything back. I've also okay, made you're, you're, the ASD uh, Facebook site as well. Okay, so um, I will go back and look. Uh, I don't recall getting an email, but this is not the time to have that discussion. Uh, if there is an email, I will. I will. Uh, it may have been forwarded to the correct person, but I'll go back and check. Thank you. Um, all right, Miss Nelson. Good evening, Misty Nelson, speaking as an AEA board member. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. What a whirlwind of a first semester it has been. I think it might be safe to say gone is the expectation that we will have a normal school year anytime soon. I'm speaking tonight regarding the ASD budget cuts and their implications. Over the last several weeks and months, I have attended town hall meetings, ASD board work sessions, school board meetings, and AEA meetings. I have done a lot of listening, a lot of observing, and a lot of asking questions. 
What I have learned in talking to my colleagues is that many of them aren't truly aware of the implications of where we are financially as a district. For the most part, unless a staff member works at one of the proposed school closure buildings or would be receiving students from the proposed school closures, employees seemed a bit removed from the discussion. It wasn't directly impacting them, so it was somewhat easier, if you will, to not be as invested. I did view the December 10th Saturday ASD board work session. I understand some possible changes will be proposed, taking some things off the table as we move forward temporarily. I think that's the key word. My speaking tonight is not necessarily for ASD's ears, but more so for our staff and our Anchorage community. It is imperative that folks understand where we are fiscally. If the BSA is not increased significantly, which it isn't looking too promising after the release of the governor's budget, and if our population continues to decline, as presented by consultant Bingham, we are looking at school closures. Not if, but when. And whether we move sixth grade to middle school in the upcoming year or later, this will decrease the enrollment at several more elementary schools, again, resulting in the very real possibility of even more school closures down the road. Some other key points for our community and staff to understand, increasing PTR does equal larger class sizes. One question that comes to mind, is the ASD board going to instruct some grades to be kept harmless, causing the impact to be felt more by other grades or divisions? As you move forward, do not close or consolidate any school, including Abbott Loop, until there is a thorough plan on what additional supports will be in place for students, families, and staff to make the transition seamless and to promote student outcomes. Hold off on making decisions that significantly impact school consolidations until ASD has had the time to educate, inform, plan, and give solid focus and time on the ramifications and implementation for what those changes will look like in motion for our students, staff, and families. Before the ASD board makes decisions, excuse me, which will hugely impact all parties, the Anchorage community needs more time to be fully informed and prepared. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite uh, Janelle Hartman to join us, please. Uh, whenever you're ready, Marnie. Thank you. My name is Marnie Hartill. I'm Vice President for Communications of Anchorage Education Association. I signed up to speak with you in regards to concerns about increasing PTR and decisions to permanently close community schools. But since then, another wave of weather-related school closures and unpaid days have diverted my attention. I'll be brief on that. I'm asking that the school district hold harmless the thousands of dedicated educators who were impacted with their students by the series of school cancellations. I support the district's decision regarding the dangerous road conditions and impassable sidewalks, but the Muni's poor management after these severe storms should not subsequently transform uh, and extend the school day for months or should extend our school year deeper into May. We have been experiencing a local emergency. So please, I encourage ASD to file for a waiver with the Alaska Department of Education. I hope for that. Now, permanently closing a school, that's another issue. Uh, I want to urge you to please support and uplift strong community schools. Parents, students, and educators see their local schools as pillars of the community that have not been adequately funded and are absolutely worth fighting for. Abbott Loop, we hear you. According to a Harvard study shared with the UC Davis Center for Poverty and Inequality Research, the findings show that, quote, while the process of changing school boundaries, closing and or consolidating schools can effectively address budget and enrollment problems, it can disproportionately affect disadvantaged students and families. Redistricting could increase educational inequality, increase segregation within schools and hurt already disadvantaged students and communities. Within the context of the study, disadvantaged parents, schools, and neighborhoods faced higher financial and opportunity costs after school redistricting. It is essential that the district officials work to ensure that minority and low-income students, families, and um, communities and schools do not bear the brunt of redistricting outcomes. After a permanent closure of an Oakland school, a seventh grade boy testified that it is, quote, like putting me up for adoption. My school made me who I am, unquote. I don't have to tell you to consider the human impact of decisions made by the board. You know that. 
I was, um, I also know what it's like when PTR is increased. My education tech position at Bartlett was cut in 2018 due to PTR. I was involuntary transferred. When PTR increased again last year, the Greening CTE computer technology program had to close and I was again involuntary transferred. And here now the ASD virtual program is on the block for consideration. And while I'm a teacher with the ASD virtual program, so the increase to PTR does have a human face. Um, it will lead to larger class sizes and cuts in elective choices. I'll write the rest of my testimony to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, let's see, Janelle, welcome. And then Christy sits. Christy, if you're here. Yes. Whenever you're ready. Hi. Hi, I'm Janelle Hartman, and I am a health teacher at Northwood Elementary and Kincaid Elementary. And I want to thank you all um, for listening to another round of testimony and public testimony and all of the work that you've done already. I am encouraged by the work sessions that I've listened to, as well as the reports that um, you've made um, in the last few weeks and months. Um, however, I do want to start um, with a question that I received from one of my students at Northwood just a couple of weeks ago. I've made a brief reference to the other school that I work at, and the student asked, is this other school they could? I could hear the bitterness and distrust in the student's voice. For the folks in the audience that may not know, the alternate school for my Northwood students would have been Lake Hood. I replied, it's not, to a classroom of hush chatter and even a rebuke of she's lying. I bring this to your attention this evening because trust and building relationships is at the core and the foundation of what it means to be an educator and what students need in order to be successful in the classroom. This is why educators spend the first few weeks building relationships so that students are willing to trust us with their learning. Putting six of our schools on this list uh, may have broken the trust between the district and the families that live in these communities. I have witnessed the attendance at Northwood precipitously decline since they were put on the potential close list back in November. Our highest priority in education is to educate, yet how can we educate students who are not showing up because the message has been sent that their school, they don't matter as much as every other school in this district who is not put on that list. Community schools are a central part to the people who live near them or whose students attend them. They are a place where they have been educated and generations have, of family members have been educated that precede and proceed the current students. Trust is built, students are educated, and these families continue to send their next generations of students to the schools that have already entrusted us with their own learning. Insecurity through displacements, lack of stability, and resources may have already run, already run high in communities with Title I community schools. Through the shuffling of students from one school to another, it does not fix any problem that may be rendered redeemable in order to move students only. It may only cause further disruptions, anxieties, attendance, challenges, and the potential for further delayed learning. We must, as a community, be willing to, to find long-term solutions rather than short-term options that will likely cause a ripple effect of further disruptions. Our students' educations literally depend on this. As a member of the AEA Human and Civil Rights Committee, as a teacher of one of the potential uh, schools on the list, a former volunteer at another, I'm here to voice advocacy for these schools and all that may come. Thriving communities do not close schools. They utilize boards like your own, governance and local support to find solutions to propel education up for further community members. I ask us as our role in education, this is our job, that we care and invest in our students, that they matter. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura Mc, Mc, McNown, Christy, whenever you're ready. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. My name is Christy and I'm a 24 year educator in the Anchorage School District and a member of the AEA board. With my current position as a preschool special education teacher on the assessment team, I am tasked with welcoming students and families every week to ASD. Each of these students and their family holds special spaces in my teacher heart. I feel empathy for the schools that were on the closure list. I taught at one of those schools for 17 years. I understand the connection that they feel with their family. I received emails regarding the program. And because of the budget deficits, it's possible that the elementary program portion of the virtual learning may be cut. I would hope that before that decision is final, that you ask me, other parents and staff to help and explore options to sustain this program for our families. My daughter, who is in first grade, graduated kindergarten from the virtual program last year. 
as it was a successful program for us and many of the other families. Now my son, who is in kindergarten virtual, is following in her footsteps. This program gives me and my family the opportunity to practice our culture, build bonds, and get to know each other's strengths through learning. I have gotten the chance to get to know my kids so much in this program, and I have been able to help them build a love for learning. All of this couldn't have been done without the continued support from the teachers, the staff, and this program. I'm willing to help in any way I can in order to help defend the elementary pro portion of this virtual learning. And that is why I'm here. I am asking at this meeting that you reconsider to not cut this program for us and our families. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Rick Whitbeck is online. Good evening. Good evening. You have three minutes. Welcome. Good evening. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bryant, President Bellamy and board, thanks for the opportunity to put my thoughts on record. My name is Rick Whitbeck. I'm the PTO president at Abbott Loop Elementary and the father of an amazing second grader there. It would be phenomenal to see zero schools closed this year. From what I heard from the various board meetings and workshops, it sounds like five out of the six may be saved. I hope Abbott Loop can be added to that list. Now I've talked either directly or through surrogates to all but one of you on the board. And I've heard for the most part that there isn't a predetermined outcome, but clearly there's some pressure and potentially even a mandate to close the school just to show the legislature that you can close one. Let's be honest. Trends say many more will probably be closed down the road. So why one now? Why the rush? If, and I hope it can be spared, you close Abbott Luth Elementary, then know that the community will be watching for a planned, smooth, and comprehensive transition plan. You cannot fail on this and have goodwill with the community as a whole going forward. When you had the uh, the open house at Abbott Loop, I asked the district and board representatives how many of our Abbott Loop students and families would need to individually qualify for Title I services. You didn't know. How many of our Abbott Loop families need those free breakfast, lunch, pre and post school after, uh, support like campfire? You didn't know. That's not good. So what I would ask is that you ensure, especially if we are the only school to close, that not one child is left behind, not one family hurt, not one student forgotten, not one tear of pain cried, not one parent feeling hopeless and not able to work the system. Families are struggling working multiple jobs, living in multi-generational arrangements, paying historically high energy prices, battling record inflation, facing economic uncertainty, and now having the shock of potential school closures. I think Abbott Loop deserves the same outcome for 2023-24 that you might be giving the other five schools. Closing one, well, it might be politically expedient, kind of a, yeah, we can do that, but it'll crush 250 kids and their families who will see our school closed, the guinea pigs of the district with zero plans before closing to keep us from being forgotten in the chaos. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to invite Jennifer Burleson and Angela Marshall. Welcome. Welcome. Is uh, Angela Marshall? You can come up. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, Jennifer. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Jennifer Burleson, and I'm a fifth grade teacher with the ASD virtual program. I've taught with ASD for the past 30 years. I'm here tonight to speak on behalf of the children and the families who cannot be here. ASD's virtual program has been a blessing for many of Anchorage's marginalized populations. In our crazy world where we assume that everyone can provide for educating their children and get them to school each day, unfortunately, that's not the case. Families are trying to survive and often this affects student att attendance. I'm here to help you understand some of the benefits which the virtual program brings to our district. Our program engages and educates families who would otherwise leave the district. Many of our students were not attending or were failing in brick and mortar school. These same students are now thriving in the virtual setting. Respectfully, I ask the board to continue to fund the ASD virtual program into the future. You may wonder how ASD helps the district. 
Currently, there are 553 full-time students, which keep approximately $4.1 million within the district. Our program provides education in a manner that is unconventional and unprecedented. ASD, ASD Virtual meets the changing needs of our community. Last year, ASD Virtual teachers were featured in Edutopia as models of exemplary virtual educators. While I understand that cuts need to be made, I implore you to learn more about the beneficial role that ASD Virtual plays within our our district. The program fills a void by delivering quality education in a non-traditional manner. Many of the families who are enrolled in ASD virtual would leave the district if this is not an option. At the elementary level, we provide multiple Zoom instructional Zoom sessions each day focusing upon core instruction as well as social studies and science. In addition, I perform intervention groups, coding clubs, SEL learning, and virtual field trips. ASD allows families who need flexibility with their schooling to remain a part of the anchor school district. By eliminating this program, ASD will take a huge step backwards. Here are a few examples from my own class this year. I've been able to engage three students who were previously absent for school for nearly two years, or excuse me, two quarters of the year. They were sent to the virtual program because they were not succeeding in the virtual or in the brick and mortar setting. One of these students has went from zero attendance in school to attending every Zoom that I hold, as well as raising his MAP scores by 10 points. In addition, I have a number of special education students who are finally learning to really beginning to flourish in fifth grade. Most people assume that ASD virtual was a flash in the pan, which would disappear after the pandemic. We do not want this to be the case. By keeping the ASD virtual program, we can continue to engage students who were previously unreachable. We know this is an issue in our community. community. That said, it seems illogical to eliminate a program which is successfully educating marginalized populations. Please consider continuing to fund it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, Angela? Hello, my name is Angela Marshall, and I am a high school teacher with ASD Virtual. And as I was mentally thinking about coming and testifying, I was getting prepared to look at all these faces of, or, or looking down, working on their computer or writing notes. So the fact that you are looking at us at the end of this hour while we're talking is greatly appreciated and a, and a pleasant surprise. So thank you for your time on that. So I wanted to spend um, my time today just talking about um, a few of the misconceptions that may be happening about the ASD virtual secondary program. Um, the ASD virtual is not just a credit recovery program. Um, while we do offer credit recovery classes, that is not the majority of our course offerings. We offer full-time and part-time opportunities for students um, for their first attempt, first attempt at their courses. Um, so as we go through our, our full-time students at the secondary level, um, they're ones that oftentimes have problems with regular attendance. Board member Bellamy mentioned about what do we do about attendance? Well, guess what? ASD Virtual has that answer, okay? Um, a lot of our students are coming to us because, because of their regular attendance issues at an in-person school school, um, it could be for a variety of reasons. Many of the high school students are playing sports out of state. They may be living away from their homes, away from their families, and so they choose virtual as their option to continue with Anchorage School District. Some of our students have health issues uh, for themselves or their families that require them to work from home on their schools. Others of our students, they are working full time to help their family's economic situation. ASD Virtual provides that opportunity for these students. Many of our part-time students choose virtual um, just as um, a, a personal preference. They prefer to take online classes. Maybe they are in school um, and they want to get ahead in their credits. They want to graduate early. So they have the option of taking part-time ASD virtual classes in order to graduate ahead of what their scheduled time was. Um, sometimes our part-time students, they like to uh, take um, an extra elective class in person, and so they need to take their core classes like English, what I teach, on their own time away from the school day. So what I can say about ASD Virtual, I am not a data person, I'm an English teacher, okay? But what I do know 
is that um, while ASD virtual might not be for every student, it is for a large population of Anchorage's school district and they deserve our best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our last two speakers, uh, Heather Painter and Mary Cruson, come forward, please. Welcome, you have three minutes. Uh, hello, my name is Heather Painter. Uh, my subject is the uh, Anchorage School District Transportation. My son is a kindergartner at Eagle River Elementary and on December 13th of this year, our son was left at Hanson and Lazy Street at approximately 417, that is uh, eight to 10 blocks away from his drop-off location across a busy road. This is a totally different neighborhood from his drop-off area. <clears throat> His school lets out at 3.30, uh, AP, APD was notified around 4.35. Original report was of a three-year-old walking alone with a backpack on a busy road. Daryl Mallell, his father, picked him up approximately at 4.45 from APD Officer LaRosa. Our son was alone and walking around for almost 20 minutes in Eagle River. The roads are not fully plowed and there were no sidewalks to walk on. Our son crossed a busy intersection gathered from the GPS tracking and little information as to where the female bus driver sighted him to a familiar area. By this time, it was dark out, very little visibility. <clears throat> he's, he's small, he's wearing dark clothing. If not for being spotted by spotted and APD being notified, this could have ended horrible. This could have ended tragically. There are people still plowing the roads and many are in a rush in these horrible road conditions. Officer LaRue was happy to speak with me when I called him later that night at 11.04 p.m. He called me back at 11.46 and answered all my questions. He was happy to hear that my son was safe. I am so thankful for LaRosa being present at this time. He mentioned to me that my son is very polite and a good kid. He shared my concerns about how he was dropped off and where. It seems like it's not far from home, but a child, a child who is always supervised, this is dangerous. The wrong person could have picked him up and no one would have known or been witnessed. He could have been hit by a vehicle that did not see him or see him in time. We, his parents, are very concerned and beyond outraged at how this happened. We wish for there to be a full investigation and an explanation as to how a child his age was treated like he didn't matter and was abandoned on an inf unfamiliar road in a different neighborhood. This has affected our family tremendously, and I want to know <clears throat> what will Anchorage School District do to protect our students from this happening again? I was told by Reliant Transportation that the driver was a seasoned driver and will continue to work in transport. How was there no chaperone on board, on, on board the bus to ensure that the younger children get on and off of the bus safely? I would also like to know why us, his parents, were not notified by the driver and why was he not transported back to the school? Reliant Transportation said that they relied on a six-year-old child to tell him where his drop-off was. I personally am fearful of him returning to school. Thank you very much. Mary, whenever you're ready. Thank you for this opportunity to speak and for your time working through ASD's budget crisis. I've listened to your work sessions and truly appreciate the thoughtful process of the school board. I, however, maintain that there's a better way forward when reckoning with a drop in enrollment and a budget crisis than a utilization numbers based school closure plan. The recent closure recommendation may or may not be comparing schools with capped pre K and special ed classes in schools that do or do not contain sixth grade. Albeit Abbott Loop seems to be the only school for now that is up for closure. As the district considers even one school and maybe in the future more, more schools to close, we can learn from other school districts around the country. We can do a better job here in Anchorage and be a school district that is written about nationally as having good decision-making and outcomes when faced with a budget crisis. Research studying school consolidation implementation in the lower 48 sure enough shows school consolidation can disproportionately impact higher need students and can lead to increased racial and economic segregation. 
One study cites a school district in Chicago where leaders attempted to use a logical framework that considered school utilization rates when deciding what schools to close. And the impact of the consolidation was not even across its students' groups. This mostly found to be related to student and family accessibility to the schools. To me, this sounds like a familiar situation occurring here in Anchorage. There's been question by the Board of Educational Outcomes related to school consolidation, and there are also studies showing nuances such as consolidating schools in more affluent neighborhoods have less negative effect on education success than in less affluent neighborhoods, as it depends on what support networks are available in the home versus being used at the school. Also, there are nuances regarding uh, the concern of multi-grade classrooms showing that they can even increase educational outcomes if done correctly. In multi-grade setting, teachers really have to prioritize tailoring teaching to its students' needs. As the district considers school closures and budget, I hope there is a comprehensive comprehensive budget plan and community advisory board may be made before recommending future school closures and navigating budget cuts. It would prevent the chaos and stress neighborhoods experienced over the last few months. Is a family in Nunaka with a next year kindergartner even going to consider sending their kid to Nunaka when the school has been recommended for closure? Does there need to be a district-wide look at school boundaries before closure recommendations are even made? Seems like there definitely needs to be more studies done on the actual savings of school closures as well as educational impacts on ASD students. Learning about Anchorage's schools during this process and what is needed from the community to make schools work well in both good and bad times has been eye-opening. Thank you for your time. And thank you very much. That concludes the end of our first hour of public testimony. Uh, we will take a 10 minute recess and be back in the room at 8.05. Thank you.
We'll begin in approximately three minutes. Look at George hanging out tonight. Hey, how you there? <laughs> yeah. You going? I'd like to welcome everybody back. I think, uh, well, we're missing two board members. You know, I give y'all 10 minutes. And we still can't make it back. Thank you, everybody that made it back. There he comes. <laughs> I'm just going to start. <laughs> All right. This brings us to, there he comes. All righty. Brings us to item, what is that item? G? All right, our con uh, consent agenda uh, um, items. Uh, Whenever you're ready. If I would like to, before we move to approve the consent agenda, I would like to remove ASD memorandum number 94, board guidance for building the FY23-24 budget and place that as action item number F3. All righty, Second. F3, thank you. Moved and second to move the action item. I don't know that we need to vote on it. It's you, it's the bo any board member can do that. Yeah. So uh, any. So with that, let's continue. Yep. So I would move to approve the consent agenda as amended. Is there a second? 
Second. It's moved and moved to approve. The motion is to approve agenda, the agenda items as amended, which would consist of items uh, two through eight. Yes, we'll, we will have to do a voice vote. Please, Amanda. Member, Sorry. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Lessons? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Member Higgins? Member Donley? Yes. Member Holloman? Yes. President Bellamy? Yes. She's taking a minute. <laughs> it didn't come up on my screen. Did it come up on yours? It passes six to one. Uh, six, uh, six yays to what? Ah, there it is. Uh, six yays to one not in the room. <laughs> All right, so that passes. <clears throat> so that brings us to, thank you board. That brings us to item F, action items. Member Jacobs. Madam President, I move to approve the expulsions of the students um, associated with ASD incident numbers 135, 135-3615, 135-3617, 135-3325, 135-3352, 135-3556, 135-3556, 135-4210, and 135-2947 as discussed in executive session. Second. Moved and second. Um, to approve the young contested student hearings that we had in executive session. Uh, is there any, uh, Member Higgins is not in the room. Here he comes. We will now vote on uncontested student hearings. Amanda. Member Holloman. Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Donley? Yes. Member Higgins? Yes. Member Lessons? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. President Bellamy? Yes. And that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, item two. Uh, under action, ASC memorandum number 024S2. Member Jacobs. Yep. Madam President, I believe this uh, is a postponed item, and so I think it's already in front of the body, having uh, been motioned to approve and then a second. So um, with your permission, I would like to speak to the current uh, motion, which is to approve the transfer of $37,712,912 um, to the ASD Capital Projects Fund to be further reallocated following board passage of the FY24 budget towards future large-scale capital projects, which prioritize student, staff, and community safety and security. Okay. With that said, um, I, I guess we've... Um, we, I think we have people signed up to, to testify. Understood. Uh, so after that, I guess I would. Uh, then you can do your. Thank okay, you. thank you. So we have people signed up to testify on memorandum number 024S2. Uh, Martin Hansen and Deborah Hansen, please come forward. You will each have three minutes. Martin, whenever you're ready. Um, well, thank you and good evening. Um, and I'm really, uh, can you, am I working this properly? Yes, you are. Thank you. We can hear you. You might pull it down just a little bit in front of, yeah. All right. Um, I've been heartened to hear uh, that we're considering uh, what I call the three R's, remodel, renovate, or repair for uh, schools. 
because this is a darn good time to save a lot of money because sadly our governor has not put in a budget to increase the base student allocation. I guess we'll all have to work on that as well. Uh, a friend of ours is a contract administrator and she looked through the construction contract for Lipview School Replacement and found the following items that would need to be addressed and were not addressed as part of the, of the costs. Demolition of the existing school, abatement costs, including lead and asbestos, administration and management of the contract, furniture, fixtures and equipment, and updated the contingency fees need to be updated because they haven't been, uh, inflation hasn't been factored in. And removal of unstable fill, including peat under the proposed new school site, and bringing in gravel to replace the unstable soils. And I speak as a minor authority on the unstable soils because our house is directly adjacent to the south end of uh, Inlet View School property. And uh, if I may say so, we have drilled 12 test holes. I put in, we put in two decks and the holes go down to three and a half feet. And we've come up with the most amazing stuff, gravel, cobbles, regular dirt, soil, silt, and worst of all, bootleggers cl cove clay. And why they brought that in or where, I don't know, but it seems to be part of the same fill that's under Inlet View School because our backyard is sinking down at exactly the same rate as your schoolyard is. Uh, you have an engineering report that says it's okay, but they only did two holes and that's not enough for a place that uh, was subject to random fill. So my point is, with these unknown expenses, what do you, what's going to happen if we spend 30 or more million dollars and then realize we're going to another need another 10 or 20? Um, I think we're just better off going down a, a more conservative road and remodeling the existing school. And I thank you very much for listening and for taking your lives in your hands to drive out here. Thank you, sir. Deborah, whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, in case you're curious, we are married to each other, <laughs> even though after 36 years, I don't really, I'm not tall and blonde yet, but I'm hoping for it. But <laughs> anyway, I wanted to thank you for listening to us. And as someone testifying earlier said, you guys aren't looking at your phones or computers, but you're actually listening to us. And I know it's horrible to sit here hour after hour. We, we've been to a lot of these meetings too, so thank you. Um, I'm a proponent also of using some of the, the budgeted money to help out some of the other schools instead of using it for a rebuild for Inlet View. The remodel is a lot cheaper. I mean, we have an old house. We keep remodeling it, and it's a lot cheaper than if we torn it down at this point. But anyway, there's no point in wasting money. I guess, there, you know, people talk about prime directives. Well, one of them has got to be for a school district to not waste money. So there's no point in wasting money. Um, one of the things that the neighborhoods really opposed it that's kind of got lost in the shuffle about the remodel we really don't want a huge parking lot and i think that's come across in a lot of testimony that's also a waste of money we would like you to listen to the community after and build some more trust with people holy cow after going seeing what the governor's done for the base student allocation remember there was there was a program years ago uh great alaska schools and the community actually can lobby the, the the legislature. I mean, I'm willing to lobby them. We need more money for schools. We need more money to support the students. You know, this is not right. Um, so we're all all in supportive of the school district, but we'd also like you to involve us in solutions. Um, just because we don't have kids in schools doesn't mean we're brain dead. We we still know what's going on. We're pretty smart. A lot of us are, at least at any rate. But and the other thing is I've observed after attending a couple of the town hall meetings, I sometimes feel like it's in the view parents versus the rest of the world. I feel there's a lot of architects, lawyers, you know, professionals in the view who can speak well and are really well connected versus some of the town halls I went to. I mean, the people there love their schools, but they're not connected politically and it's not fair. And I guess it's your job to equalize things. And I expect the school district to do that because these all these kids are our future. All the kids, even the Title I kids, whoever. But as another lady said, we at our school, we take care of our kids. We make sure they have winter clothes. I know the Title I school that Martin works at, they do the same thing. You've been to Willowa, uh, Chairman 
president, sorry, um, <laughs> czar, or whatever. Um, anyway, they take care of their schools and it's important, but I expect you as a school board and I trust that you will take care of all of our children in the school district. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd uh, like to invite Lois Epstein and, okay, and uh, Mitchell Cullum. I think Lois is on the phone. Star six to unmute, Lois. Star six to unmute. Okay, can you hear there me? You, go. you have three minutes. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and good evening, President Bellamy, other school board members, and those in the audience. My name is Lois Epstein, and I'd like to speak about a potential budget solution. Um, I'm sorry I had to leave the meeting just now. I attended the work session and uh, it just left the dog at home for too long. Uh, so I'm pulled over uh, in Fred Meyer parking lot. Uh, to address the $48 million deficit resulting from several years of inadequate state education funding, the Anchorage School District proposed closing six elementary schools with five of six located in low-income neighborhoods. Thankfully, most or all of these schools will stay open following excellent community testimony at town hall meetings. There are still problems with ASD's budget that need to be addressed, however. Despite its dire financial situation, ASD's capital improvement plan for 2022 to 27 includes nearly 38 million for a rebuild of downtown in Lidview Elementary School, almost 80% of the current deficit of 48 million. Proposed rebuild is the most expensive capital project on the CIP list, even though Inland View has the seventh smallest enrollment of the district's 58 elementary schools as of November 2022. Regarding the budget revisions for fiscal year 2022 to 2023, which will be voted on today, ASD cannot justify such a costly expenditure on Inland View for a rebuild when a remodel likely would cost 10 to $15 million less similar to what has been done for Turnigan Elementary. Additionally, a rebuild of Inlet View should not move forward given last April's bond failure. Yes, Inlet View would have fewer years of life with a remodel rather than a rebuild, but a remodel's lower cost is what ASD can afford at this time. A remodel would extend the school's lifespan for decades. Information on the cost of an Inlet View remodel has been intentionally or unintentionally equated by rebuild supporters with the cost effectiveness by year of a rebuild. The fact that a rebuild could last 50 years is not that relevant when a cheaper 20 to 30 year remodel was devised and is affordable for ASD at this time. In Lidview is a beloved neighborhood school. It currently is located on the north side of its site to take advantage of sunlight within the school and throughout the playground, as well as the better subsurface for a building on the north side. Remodeling and renovating the school at its current location not only would save money, but would be a better decision for our community. Thank you for your attention to these points and for your thoughtful discussion of an Inlet View remodel at the last board meeting. Our community is listening in. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Uh, Collum, you're next. Welcome. Hi, good evening. My name is Mitchell Cullum. I am a former ASD student, father of, of a future student, husband to an ASD teacher, and South Edition Community Council member that served on the Building Design Committee for the Inlet View Project. <clears throat> I urge the board to use some of the remaining $37 million of bond debt reimbursement for an Inlet View remodel. A remodel that doesn't have to start from scratch, but one that has already been paid for and already advanced to the 35% stage. The remodel design that the administration spoke of last at last week's work session would address all issues and concerns with the current school. It would also keep the school footprint in its current location, which is an issue for many adjacent neighbors. And it would also save 10 to $15 million at a time when this money could be used to help close the deficit without increasing the student to teacher ratio. Increasing the student to teacher ratio as proposed by the administration and some board members would not only have a negative impact on student academic performance, which is appallingly dismal, but it would also have a negative impact on teacher retention and the ability to attract new teachers at a time of significant unfilled teacher positions. 
I want to make a couple of points regarding the new construction inlet view design that has been proposed. The building material costs that were assumed for the remodel versus new construction replacement decision were based on 2015 building material costs. These obviously aren't accurate assumptions with today's building material costs, and there are a lot of reusable materials in the old school. Also, the total capital costs associated with the new construction school option assumed a 50 to 60 year lifespan, yet didn't include a new roof at 30 years or a midlife remodel. Therefore, the cost per year of life were inaccurate and too little and created an inappropriate bias for a new construction replacement. Please note that the school you are proposing to close, Abbott Loop Elementary, is a 42-year-old school and you have identified it at the end of its useful life or in need of a major remodel. I hope that you keep in mind your role as board members. It is to look out for the interests of the students and the Anchorage community as a whole and not to worry about appeasing some politicians with a new school. I urge you to use the savings from an inlet view remodel rather than a new construction replacement to not increase the student to teacher ratio district wide. I think that you all know that attaching a $38 million inlet view replacement in the 2024 bond would be a toxic addition. Please keep this in mind with your decision this evening. Thank you very much. That include, uh, concludes uh, the speakers. Uh, for memorandum 024S2. Uh, now we're open to discussion. Uh, Member Jacobs. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. I was just going to uh, urge support for the underlying and original language here um, as it gives the board flexibility and um, prioritizes these funds for capital purposes. And I think that should be where our priorities lie. Um, given our other significant pools of one-time funding. Um, with that said, um, my plan was to um, to move to call the question, but I, I see that Member Donnelly has an amendment and I'm I'm not interested in cutting off conversation um, if other members have amendments, so I'll um, yield the floor with that. All right, so the motion before us is to um, the original language. Uh, could you put that up, Amanda? Actually, I can look it up on my own screen. <laughs> okay, it'll come up. We're back to the original language for memorandum. Yeah, do we, no, we, it's already on the table because it was, this is a carryover. So we don't, we didn't need to go through that part again. The original language, I'll just read it while you pull it up, Amanda. I'm sorry. Oh, you did. Okay, so it's been read, so everybody knows. So, um, they, Member Donnelly, you have a, an amendment? Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm concerned that by designate, locking this into capital dollars, we raise expectations in the community of with future use of these towards only capital projects, we have an ongoing serious operating budget problem uh, that we don't have a solution for next year. Even if we do the things that I think we're, you know, we've discussed and we're on course to closing the gap for this year, we're nowhere near addressing the issues that we're faced with next year. And this money may be it might be in the future a decision of the board that this would be a higher use to use towards that addressing those issues rather than locking it into capital at this time. Also, the dollar amount, you know, tends to indicate a particular project, which I think is unfortunate, even though this doesn't say it's for a particular project. Uh, but I think it raises expectations that it might be for that. And uh, I agree with the testimony we heard tonight. I think that would be a serious mistake to move forward with that particular project. Um, additionally, I would think that any of the, any major project, we would want to go to a bonding process so the public would have a say in this just as we've been doing over the past, well, as long as I've been on the board, um, with the exception of some money that we approved this last fall, which uh, I believe there was overwhelming public support for 
and was uh, part of the bond that I think the vast majority of people were voting for, especially the safety vestibules at our elementary schools and safety upgrades. So with all that, we had a main motion on the floor and I moved to amend the main motion um, uh, to simply substitute uh, for capital projects, the word general. And as in general to, fund? Yeah, and to delete uh, the following language after fund. And I believe members have it before them. And so I would move that motion at this time. Okay, is there a second? Hearing no second, we are back to the main motion, uh, which is right before you, to approve the transfer of 37 plus million to the ASD Capital Projects Fund to be further reallocated following board passage of uh, FY24 um, toward future large scale capital projects which prioritize students, staff, and community safety and security. Um, I, the, I, <laughs> I, I would like to just say that there there is there was nothing while well, it's this money came um not allocated to any one thing. So we can use it as we see fit going forward. So with that, um we're back to the main motion. Comments before we vote. I I guess as a point of information, um I'm a little confused about what this does. As you say, this is money that's unallocated, um, but this motion doesn't really allocate it. If the administration had an idea for using it, they would have to come back to the board and and present that. It would have to be moved and passed again. So it almost seems like it should be a resolution. I mean, this is a motion that doesn't actually accomplish anything other than to say what the board's wishes might be in a general, vague, unspecific way, which I admire language like that. I want to be on the record of saying I'm often vague and unspecific myself. But I, I am con confused about why it's a motion and what the net result of it is. So the one thing I can uh, add to uh, maybe provide a little clarity although it might be more confusing, is that this was part of a bigger memo, which we bifurcated, and we took this part out of it. And so we use the original language. But I saw Member Jacob's hand. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. This goes back to um, a September Finance Committee meeting, and um, my understanding is that yeah. administration might be able to shine some light as to that the, these funds can be transferred to the, the capital project um, and that there is a line item in our budget for it and that they would need to be further reallocated, but it would um, move that money functionally within our budget. And so, Dr. Bryant, perhaps you or your staff can chime in there. Yeah, I'll ask I'd CFO Jim Anderson to respond. Sure, through the president to member Jacobs. Um, I, I think everyone's checking that these particular funds are, are incredibly flexible and can be used for, for pretty much any operational or capital use. Um, there have been, um, people who have, have provided testimony saying that, that these funds were approved for a very specific purpose. Okay. And we've heard that in multiple meetings. Um, but the reality is these funds have the most generic language attached to them. Um, there would be nothing in the bill that would preclude it from going to the general fund or the capital fund. Madam President, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that was the underlying question is um, this language does accomplish moving those funds to the capital project line item in our budget, correct? I may have misunderstood the um, proposed amendment. It looks like it would move it to the operational fund and or the general fund until after the budget is passed and then could be pending board decisions reallocated towards capital. I think I think that's, that's the way I interpreted. I thought so. Reallocated following 
reallocated um, following passage of point, the 2024 point budget. of information i think i think mr anderson might be thinking of member donnelly's amendment not the oh, original language i am um, member donnelly's amendment failed to get a second yeah. so the underlying yeah. language is now on the floor which as i understand it now as we've discussed at multiple meetings and the finance committee um meeting in september well, would that. move this would move this 37 million dollars to our capital um project line item or area of the budget that that is correct i, I did get it confused language. with the amendment okay. it this <clears throat> particular language would move it to the capital um project fund but if not allocated for specific projects and the board were to choose tonight to use some of that to cut um district deficit that that could also be accomplished from any fund it would just be a transfer that would cause that funding to be transferred from capital to general fund yeah. thank you better president that uh, what was my roundabout way of getting member holloman his answer thank you. okay thank you <laughs> uh i see is, is that your hand up again okay um having heard that it, i mean my personal feeling is while we're still looking at these cuts and and we're undecided on what we want to do yet that continuing to have this money sit and be unallocated in any way is a benefit. I, I'm certainly not sure what I want to do with it yet. So it, it seems to me that no action is necessary for that to happen, for us to continue to go forward with our budget deliberations with $37 million in our back pocket, so to speak. Um, you know, I, I think the administration understands we're uncertain and they may suggest allocating part of it um which i guess means i my inclination would be to vote no on the motion and just continue status quo while we work out what we're going to do about various programs and schools and other budget items thank you member lessons <clears throat> thanks i'll be brief i will support allocating or dedicating these funds towards future capital towards future capital projects. I think they can be strategically deployed as they were intended as school bond debt reimbursement so as to offset taxpayer burden. And I think if we are uh, savvy, we can produce additional savings in, in excess of this amount for taxpayers by offloading and then front loading items off of the just approved CIP and in so doing improve student health safety and learning environments. So I look forward to revisiting this discussion uh, following passage of the FY24 budget. Any other uh, comments before we vote? <clears throat> oh, okay, member uh, Higgins, and then we'll come to Donnelly. I am going to uh, agree with uh, member lessons. Uh, this isn't dedicated to a particular project, but we know we have tremendous backlog of capital project needs that are critical. I mean, you go to a school and you see a leaking of the roof, and it also doesn't devote it to any one project. It allows relocate, re, you know, the remodeling activities. We could use it for that for the schools that we know are in critical need of that type of activities, we could stretch it out. And we also have flexibility with it still. It doesn't absolutely tie our hands on what we're doing. We can reverse some of this money because it's not bond money that is, is there. So you have the ability to move in and out. You can make that kind of change if we really want to, but it shows a commitment that we're addressing those issues that are that are really critical to maintaining schools, period. I mean, to having leaky roofs, to you name it, just doesn't make sense because uh, it's going to cost us more down the road. And we're trying to do that. If we get the capital funds um, uh, through bonding or do some other stuff and, and get additional funding, we can always do some back and forth. But some of this, so much critical need right now anyway, Inlet View is just to remodel as, a, as an aspect, but there's so much more that I just feel comfortable that we're putting it there, but we're not dedicating all of it to any one project, which I think is kind of what we heard from the public as well. Uh, Member Donnelly, did you have a comment? Thank you, yeah. It's really <coughs> symbolic um, because anytime the board could take this money and spend it on anything else as the board wanted to, uh, by designating this moment in time as capital, doesn't mean we that because is. there's nothing here that appropriates it or spends it on capital so it's still on the table to utilize however we see fit um 
but I do think that it's it raises expectations for some people, and the dollar amount raises expectations, which I disagree with. Um, and I agree with Member Hallman. It's 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 an amazing opportunity to have this flexibility, have these funds on the table for dealing with what we're looking at over the next, if not this year, um, then certainly next year, uh, the, the projected budget gap for next year. So I, I just, I'd hate to raise expectations uh, with a vote that really doesn't commit the money in the end to any particular expenditure. Okay, uh, Member Jacobs. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. I'll, um, now that I've, I've gone down the informational path, I guess I'll, I'll get to the persuasion path. I, um, I, I think I, I agree with the underlying language in that it still offers flexibility, but I, I also, um, while we have financial flexibility and legal flexibility to use it, um, it, I take it very seriously that these funds, um, had we been paid this money um, as scheduled, um, would have gone straight to debt service and towards um, reducing the burden on local taxpayers. And so how we use this particular tranche of one-time funding to me is is of the utmost importance. And I think that um, allocating these funds to operating is not something I'm comfortable with at this time. Um, we can have further conversations and that could potentially change. But um, I think that these funds should be focused on capital uh, purposes for um, as long as feasible. And um, we have other tranches of one-time funding. We've allocated north of $50 million to address our um, FY24 budget deficit. That's a large amount of money. And um, I think that the legislature is asking that we um, take every reasonable approach to reduce spending. Um, I think that um, our budget process is still ongoing and there's ways to examine how we make ourselves more efficient um, while um, keeping the programs that our community holds dear um, and continuing to advocate to, to Juno that um, we get much needed funding increases um, that should have been accomplished years ago. So I think that there's a path forward, but for this particular um, issue and these particular funds, um, my preference is that they, they remain focused on capital projects. Um, if there weren't a need, and if we didn't have hundreds of millions of dollars of capital needs, that might be a different conversation, but there is a huge outstanding need across our district right now, um, regardless of any particular projects we'd like to bring up. So th those are my thoughts. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yes, Member Donnelly. Nobody else has it. Just want to. I just wanted to point out that we did uh, obligate and actually obligate and expend over thirty million dollars just a few months ago on capital. From, from uh, this was the same source of money as this money, so we made a, a a really strong commitment to what were the highest needs identified this year uh, by the district. And um, so we have made a very significant commitment to capital already with the, with the funds that were the source of the same pot, pot of money. Um, and if there was a specific proposal before us right now for property tax relief, I, I'd be very inclined to vote for it with these funds, but there isn't one. Mm -hmm. It's just to dedicate it towards, um, uh, well, just to say in some future vote, we may take these and use them for capital, but we still on the table to use for other things. Okay. Seeing no other comments? Yes, go ahead. Sorry. No, I I've been taking my time listening to all of all the board members um before I spoke. And and what I hear consistently from each one of us is that we still have an opportunity to allocate that money for whatever projects we feel the need to. Um and this budget after the budget conversation is over and because we're going to need um, to complete this conversation before we can make those decisions. Um, I, I do support the language as written that it should go to the capital pro projects fund. Um, again, <laughs> and, until we can have a true conversation um, about our future needs and, and to what I'm going to go ahead and agree with you, Member Higgins. Um, I don't often do that, right? <laughs> uh, that there is a huge need. I mean, there's there's huge need in our district for um, 
for all kinds of issues to make sure that our, our buildings are, are functioning well um, to save money by doing those repairs without allowing those repairs to go undone. So I, I again, I, I support the language as written for the money to be allocated to the capital project fund with, um, and, and I'm very content with the fact that we have the opportunity to make changes if we need to. Okay. With that, I think I'm going to call for the question. Let's go, Amanda, when you're ready. Yeah, well, we can do a voice vote. Okay. Because I don't think everybody's got their computer hand. Maybe. <laughs> Member Holloman? No. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Member Lessons? Yes. Member Higgins? Member Donnelly? No. President Bellamy? Yes. All right, that uh, motion passes. Um, six, I mean, five, I'm sorry, five to two. And I'm glad it's off the agenda. It's been on there since October. Just saying. Thank you. All right, so let's move on now to um, action item number three, F3, ASD memorandum number 94. Madam President, I move to um, approve ASD memorandum 94. Um, it is the uh, recommendation that the that, um, school board approve and amend the FY23-24 budget recommendations as final guidance for the development of the budget in January 2023. The FY2023-2024 budget will be presented for board approval in February of 23 in the meeting timelines provided in the municipal charter. Is there a second? To approve the guidance to Second. The administration. That was Kelly. Member Lessons, second. So moved and second. <clears throat> Point of order. Yes. Um, when was this document made public? When did the public first have the opportunity to see this document? Uh, Amanda, I can, can you, was it Friday? Oh, no, Saturday? No, nope, it was on Friday. It's always 72 hours prior Automatic. to the meeting. Um, and it was actually a little more than 72 hours. It posted first thing Friday morning. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It, well, I guess still, shouldn't it have gone on the non-action calendar for tonight if it was just 72 hours notice? Because this was the first time any this has been before the board, this particular memorandum. So it, and that is correct. But at our work session, uh, the administration wanted to know sooner rather than later so that they have January to build the budget. It will all come back. Whatever is in the preliminary budget will come back to us. This is just guidance for them to get started to build the budget. Okay. And I and and it is unusual for us to give guidance in advance. <laughs> we it's, but that's what that's what uh, we actually worked on. Uh, that was the purpose of our activity on Saturday to see where there was general consensus so that we can capture that, bring it back here. Uh, give give um, the administration some guidance so that they can start building the budget. Now, that's how I recall it. Well, if, Madam President, if this was drafted on Friday, we didn't have our meeting till Saturday. No, no, no. This was not, you mean not last, this was drafted. We had our meeting Saturday the 10th. Yeah. This came after that. Okay. Thank you. That's guidance. I, I just, I, my point is still, it should be on a non-action calendar, but if the board wants to deal with it, I imagine you can do that. So. Uh, okay, point well taken. M Member Higgins? I guess uh, this is being interpreted as saying this is the final vote on what we're going to accept in the budget or not, or what, no. what we're providing direction because uh, this is not the I final. understand where, where uh, Member Donnelly's coming from. It's kind of like saying, you know, you're approving this at this point in time versus this is direction the board wants to do. So as a collective group, that's a, there are some issues in here I obviously have objections to, 
and um, I, the eight million dollars is new uh, in regards to that transfer since we just transferred thirty seven and a half, and I assume this is eight from out of, the, out of that that you're re re requesting that we reverse that after we just voted on it. Uh, it sounds like, and so I'm just a little bit uh, nervous about this as well. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, I thought it was actually. Well, I don't, I can't remember um, who, who's, so we all gave our consensus. We went around, we did the activity. This is the outcome as of the activity where there was general board consensus. This does not, this just starts to build the budget with these ideas in mind, with these guardrails in mind, and it's all going to come back to us. This does not define the budget entirely. It gives guidance to the school to the uh, staff as to how to build a budget. Member Jacobs, your comments. We'll go back to. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. I just so wanted maybe you to, can explain it better than me. I I don't know about that. I was just going to to share from my perspective that this is um, the, well. The administration drafted the memorandum. There, my understanding is their attempt was just to in, uh, encapsulate the the what the majority will um, express clearly. Um, on during our Saturday work session. Um, with that said, I guess I, um, I'm i inter my understanding is that this, is, this, this guidance is time sensitive, which is why um, it's um, an action item tonight, I guess. Could Dr. Bryant, could that's something you could speak to? Yes, uh, through the president, uh, Member Jacobs, I do wanna clarify a couple of points about what tonight's memo is and what it is not. It is not a vote on the final budget that will take place closer to February, at which point there'll be yet another opportunity to for the board to provide um, amendments or potentially feedback um, over multiple weeks. What this is, is essentially a summary of what we gathered as board consensus at our activity on Saturday. Um, so the for, on the 10th. Um, so from the administration's point of view, there shouldn't be any surprises, but we did design this memo to be highly amendable. And that's the purpose of tonight. So for example, one item where there wasn't clear consensus, but was discussed um, was the idea of potentially using school bond debt reimbursement money to fund the balance of the deficit closer to February. So that is one example of an option that's on the table. Another thing that came from our discussion on Saturday um, was this conversation around sixth grade to middle school. So that's why today's program entailed a discussion specifically on the sixth grade to middle school issue. So that way the board has the opportunity to propose an amendment if that's of interest, because essentially speaking, um, both school closures and a move such as moving sixth graders to middle school requires many months of determining logistics and other operational considerations. So we did make it clear um, for months that those decisions would need to be made in December. So that's why that, that's kind of the backstory and how we arrived to this more unconventional approach. Um, but again, I don't think anything in that memo should be a surprise. It's a summary of our uh, activity. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Uh, Amanda, did we notify the board that this would be on consent? Um, yes, the board was notified on the 15th of December that this would be on the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, did you have a follow up, Member Jacobs? I did, yep. Um, with your um, permission, Madam President, I have a, an amendment, um, and I believe I sent it to Ms. Foster a few minutes ago. I'm, I'm going to uh, move to amend that the um, ASD memorandum number 94 um, be amended by striking the paragraph which begins state bond debt reimbursement funds. Second. If I can speak to my amendment. Yep. So this is really just um, squaring the inconsistency that Member Higgins correctly mm -hmm. captured that um, the memorandum 24 <clears throat> uh, now now passed clearly articulates that the school bond debt fund should be prioritized for capital projects until the board um, so yeah. reallocates that those dollars. Um, and so to um, align memo 24 and 94, um, I'm asking that the board approve an amendment to remove uh, the language, which includes up to 8 million school bond debt reimbursement as part of the equation for the time being and the guidance we're providing to staff. Thank you. Okay, so the motion before you uh, by member uh, Jacobs and second by Ms. Kelly, member Lessons is to remove the state bond debt reimbursement uh, based on our prior action, 
to remove those funds, um, up to $8 million to remove that whole section uh, from the guidance. Um, any other discussion? Member Higgins. Yeah, it, mine's going to be questions more than anything else. If we're going to be reducing a reduction, the question becomes where are we going to add uh, reductions to be able to offset it. I've got the same issue and some other items. Um, I, I really don't want to close school right now. And I, that's a permanent decision that's here we, that, that is difficult to reverse even when we get more money from state. But well, how, if we don't do the eight million, we're going to need to give the direction to the administration where to cut that. Um, I, I know we get, we talked about different items to include in there that could have been included. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure where we closed on any of those. It's a little bit fuzzy to me right now, uh, cause it really was more of a discussion in maybes and what could come out of it. But it seems to me that we're going to have to fill the void of the eight million. And the question is how. So I propose that if, whether there's some way to, um, kind of connect in here. A, a reduction in the cuts with the replacement because we're going to have to do that one way or the other. And, and I, okay, and I, I'll hold my comment until Member Jacobs. Yep. So I, I feel like the question might be to me, and so I was just going to chime in briefly. It was, it's a fair point, Member Higgins. Um, my understanding of this memorandum um, is that the administration didn't ask the board to balance the budget. That, that's um, something that they, they write up in a budget book and that we approve and amend. Um, they've asked for guidance as to what is off the table, what are we leaning and towards. Yeah. Um, and so while our exercise hinted that, you know, maybe that was a goal, um, I think that the administration indicated that this is the the most guidance that they've received in nearly a decade, and so I think we've we've done good work here. Um, I'm comfortable with removing this language, knowing that that doesn't square everything, but that we can continue to have a few uh, further conversation. With that said, there were other items that there wasn't necessarily consensus on. Um, one of them was, I think, a multi hundred thousand dollar cut um, to school administration that that isn't in this memo. Um, there certainly is um, looking at fund balance. Uh, which requires a supermajority vote of the board. There's also um, ASD virtual. Um, so there's there's other options for us to do that. Um, but I, I guess the point of this memorandum, from my understanding, was not for us to balance the budget for right. the um, board administration. And that's something I think that actually the Council of Great City Schools would support as well. Okay. Thank you, Member uh, Jacobs. Uh, Member Holloman. I guess I have a point of information. Um, because this doesn't give us an exact balance sheet. If if we were to approve everything that's suggested here, does that give us a balanced budget? No, it does not. Okay, we're so going to still have to work toward uh, finding, the administration is going to have to work toward finding more cuts. Correct. And if I recall our conversation during our activity, one of the reasons why there was some interest in exploring the idea of delaying a vote on school bond debt reimbursement is because that could be one way to balance to balance the deficit, but it didn't have to be. Um, we would have a couple of months to provide alternatives if there are any that could amount to eight million that would uh, be favorable to the board. Um, upon reviewing all the different options, it didn't seem like there were very many options that we had already brought to the table. These would be new options if they even exist. And I, what's confusing me a little bit is the language where it says for bond debt reimbursement up to $8 million. Um, I think uh, the cuts came to about $40 million mm -hmm. that, uh, from our activity, mm -hmm. came to about $40 million. And so we were we would have been eight put point something short. So if we adopt everything that's on this page, where are we at? You would be at 40, 48 million with the 8 million from the bond debt, I believe. Help me out, Jim. Okay. That, that's correct. So it, by approving this memo as is, it would say that the board is open to the notion of setting aside $8 million for the purpose of balancing our current deficit. Uh, Jim, would you like to add any additional clarification? But, but it doesn't actually balance the, the deficit. If it's if it's out of here, no, it doesn't. If we take anything out of okay. out of this uh, memo, I'm I'm it, saying this memo as it exists. I'm not taking anything out of it. Right. No. But as it exists. What was said earlier was that still doesn't balance us. Right. We still have work to do. So and yeah, okay, feel, we, feel free to correct. Can we get a me. number on how how much yeah. of a gap yeah. there is left? So if you add everything that's in the memo and you include the eight million dollars flexibility for the administration. Um, then it would allow, it would be 
pretty much a balanced budget. There's a few things missing off this memo, um, which member Jacobs brought up one of them, and that was $300,000 for um, some school positions. Uh, three positions. So it's missing about 300,000 in the month of January. Assuming this passes, the reason I put um, the 8 million to be flexible was because we still have things that we're going to keep looking at. But what we've been talking about since October, um, when I, I put a timeline at the very end of the brief was that tonight, December 19th, was final board guidance, not so I could put the board in, into a corner and, and have you make final decisions because the decisions are going to be made in February. The guidance is, is tonight. Um, but what we didn't want to do was surprise the school board or surprise the community with a budget in February that, that people didn't know something was coming. So if everything in this memo were to get approved, that would allow us the flexibility to get to a balanced budget. So it's $40 million until you get to the $8 million for state bond debt reimbursement. Although when Dr. Bryant and the staff continues to work in January, we may find some other areas where we're going to recommend different reductions. So it might not be $8 million. It might end up being $7 million, or it might be some other number. Um, I just wanted to put some flexible use not to exceed cap. So I didn't surprise the board and Dr. Bryant didn't surprise the board. When we come back in February with, hey, we thought we'd use 37 million of that and keep our, no, we, we don't want surprises. That was the whole point of having this last five and a half months um, with continuing to talk about December 19th being the date for final guidance. So nobody, not the seven board members, not the public, nobody is surprised in February. Although there will be changes because we will continue to look at areas we can trim around the edges. Uh, did that answer your question? Okay. Kelly, did you have a question? I don't even, this is such an interesting document because we've never done it before. It is highly amendable, but I don't know the utility of making detailed amendments. So I'm just going to speak right now and say that there are many things on this that I will support. I think that the exercise on the 10th was very effective in getting a lot of consensus. Speaking personally, I was surprised at the allocation of school bond debt funds here. Um, and I was also surprised at the uh, continued focus on ASD virtual at that $690,000 level when I recall hearing a number of board members express willingness to give direction to the administration to have a more aggressive approach towards the ASD virtual. Mm -hmm. uh, caveat is that ASD virtual, like so many other programs, serves students who need those programs. And um, this all goes back to Juno. So we have some time between now and when the board has to pass our budget in February. And I hope that every community member mm -hmm. um, picks up their phone and shoots an email or somehow tracks down their legislator and the governor and expresses their commitment to education. The Based on the pro forma, the BSA increase of $30 per student next year is going to give us $2.6 million. $2.6 million is not very much money. Mm -hmm. um, there, mm -hmm. So there's a lot more that we um, need to ask for. Um, so I, I feel comfortable largely approving this. I guess I would like to see the ASD virtual item amended. Um, and the other thing, just, just speaking, is that I, I don't know that I'm going to be able to vote in February to support the Abbott Loop closure without also seeing whatever investment is necessary to ensure those students are successfully transferred to the receiving schools. And I don't know what that number is, um, but that's something that's very important to me. Um, Thank you, Member Lessons. 
Uh, Dr. Bryant, did you have a comment? I, I did want to just comment that ASDV is a perfect example of how we can continue to refine our budget reductions. So one of the reasons why that $8 million school bond debt number was put out there was because it's essentially a not to exceed. And I know that some board members were interested in reviewing a proposal for additional cuts beyond what we proposed for ASDV. So that, among all the other items in those memos, can be revised and potentially shrink that gap to where we don't have to depend on the school bond debt funds to balance our deficit. So I just wanted to uh, be clear about that and to also underscore that this is not the end of the budget process. Um, as Madam President shared with the board via email today, um, additional processes will include additional workshops, additional meetings with groups of board members and conversations potentially here at the dais. But this will allow us to operationalize some of the very things that you brought up. For example, um, if the board gave direction on a school closure, this provides the administration with months to look very closely at what that transition plan could look like. Um, but we would be reluctant to create these intricate plans for a closure that may not happen. So this provides the opportunity for us to make our implementation plan stronger. So that's why we're proposing to go about business this way. Yeah, okay. Uh, I guess, Member uh, Holloman, you guys good down here? Yeah. So, I, I appreciate that this is advisory to a it strong is. degree. It, that might have been a better word. Yes, yeah, which, <laughs> um, which presents the opportunity to just speak out against a certain part of it and not actually make an amendment. And then you don't have to have your amendment <laughs> fail. And and maybe maybe people think there's more passion for your particular position than there really is. And you win without actually ever taking a vote. Does that work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd like to say... I, the more I've thought about school closures, and, and I appreciate very much the work the administration has done to where we're looking just at one school right now, that this is something that the district hasn't done much of. And the, the one closure that I would call a real closure is one we did on base, There's where we nice. closed a school where if you stood on the roof of it, you could see the other two schools that all the students were going to, and all those kids stayed in their community. And the community is highway transient anyway, because it was all uh, people that are members of the Air Force and they come and go a whole lot. A neighborhood school in our in our civilian neighborhoods is a very different matter in this case, because the schools are further apart. We are splitting kids off into different directions. Um, and so the question is, are, are we doing it right? And I don't know that any of us have the expertise to know the answer to that because we've never done it before in Anchorage that I can recall if in in the 20 some years that I've been mm -hmm. been part of the district I haven't I, I can't recall seeing it happen mm -hmm. so I, I would like to know more about how we do that and in particular how we do address those families and children in making that division um, and of I always feel bad about this. Yeah, I, I would like for you to go find another million dollars so we don't have to do this. And I, I realize the difficulty in that. But um, I would like for us to look at the closure of Abbott Loop. I think because of issues with the building and everything, a lot of us kind of accept that closing Abbott Loop is an inevitable thing. And it probably is given the cost of, of renewing it unless our population growth changes dramatically. But I think for the price of a million dollars, we may be able to wait a year. I also recognize that saying we're going to wait a year can be a highly corrosive thing to a school. We're not going to close you at the end of this school year. We're going to do it in a year and a half from now. Um, that it's sort of like telling your wife you're going to divorce her in a year and a half, not mm -hmm. next month, but you know, like 18 months from now. It has an impact, and of course, it's a little unpredictable. So I I would like for there to be some work on that with a little bit of a plan of how we do it. Can we do a, a really good and decent job of it by the end of the school year? Mm -hmm. Or can would a year help? Or would a year hurt? And what would it cost in terms of repair to the school? 
Well, I don't think we'd have to do a lot of repairs in the coming year. I think we would went by unless there was a, an actual safety issue. Um, but I, like I say, I think a lot of us accept that Abbott Loop's going to close because of the huge amount of capital improvement that has to be done to it. It's just simply the timing. And if a million dollars buys us a year, and if that year really matters, um, I, I think that's worth looking at. But putting it off by a whole year may be an issue, and I'm really not sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take us back to the motion to amend the memorandum by removing the paragraph entitled School Bond Debt Reimbursement. Um, Member Lessons, I saw your hand faintly. Is it about that motion? Or no? no. Can you hold it then? Okay. All right. Amanda. Member Lessons? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Holloman? No. Member Higgins? Member Donnelly? No. President Bellamy? Yes. Okay, so uh, that, what do we have? Three to four, It that motion fails. No, I'm sorry, it passes three to four. Thank you. Um, yes, okay. Member Donnelly. Um, since we just lost $8 million towards closing the, the budget gap, um, I'd like to go back and revisit one of the items that was on the table Saturday, and that's, uh, doing away with the middle school model. That's the the projected savings at that time was $3.8 million. But I'm not sure because this, this proposal before us now is kind of hybrid moving sixth graders to middle schools, which is different than eliminating the middle school model um, and somehow reducing band and orchestra over time, sixth grade band and orchestra over time. So I'm not sure if it would still save 3.8 million. So I'd have to ask Mr. Anderson for clarification there. Uh, what if we added doing away with the middle school model? Through the president to member Donnelly, um, we've started the more detailed analysis of the middle schools during the work session. It was apparent that more than four, which is what it takes of the board members, um, were extremely reluctant to change the planning period time. Um, so as we briefed you at, I think it was three o'clock today, that we were moving forward with um, the higher PTR potentially, depending on board guidance tonight, even a, a higher PTR, but you don't get those cost savings that you would if you change the planning periods. But we, with the rest of the memo, as with that one, we went with, if there were four board members feeling very strongly about something or more, um, that we kind of went that direction for this memo. So what would happen in reality is um, as, as we finish up the sixth grade to middle school for some of the middle schools on the north end of town for year one, and we come back with the details probably in the next couple months, um, at that point, principals would have enough information to start building um, some some flexible scheduling to determine how much of the two and a half million from sixth grade band and orchestra could be saved um and and we would have much clearer details but this is going to take a lot of effort with principals um after the decision is made before you're going to see class schedules for next year showing which electives will be offered and which ones wouldn't i'm, I'm president i understand. Okay, I understand that, Mr. Anderson. What I'm asking is, if, what if we amended this to include elimination of the middle school model, the extra planning periods, how much would the potential savings been? At, the, at our Saturday meeting, that projection was 3.8 million. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so now that we, we know that we can't pull this off in one year, so it'd certainly be less than that. Um, it's gonna take us at least two years to have all sixth graders at elementary move to middle schools. And a lot of that is because um, the middle schools on the south side of town, 
we need that extra year of them shrinking a little bit more before we can do that. So the 3.8 would be spread out over a couple of years, years if you got rid of the middle school model, but we don't have the exact amount for year one or year two at this point. We, we need a little bit more work. Okay, so Madam President, with that information, I know that last year during the budget process, the estimate was $2.3 million would be saved by eliminating. So I think I would, this time I would move to amend this list of uh, possible savings to include 2.3 million for um, elimination of the middle school model, the extra planning period in middle school. Is there a second? There appears to be no second for that. Are there any other amendments? Member Jacobs. Uh, yep, um, not a not a, an amendment at this point, but we do have um, a subject matter expert in the audience. Uh, while we're talking about the middle school model, I was wondering if you would allow me to ask if Corey Ace has uh, any perspective from the staff angle. Um, if we're not putting him on the spot, thank you. Well, member, I, uh, I'd like to see. I'd like to see it opened up to the public and then get noticed if we're going to have other people testify on that. So are you objecting to Mr. Yes. Inks? Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, I think um, Mr. Inks know how to send us information if he would like for us to have it. I do. I know that from our work session on the 10th, there was no appetite for cutting middle school. I mean, limited. I mean, obviously you want to cut it. I know in my in the group that I planned with, uh, keeping middle school, as we transition sixth graders to middle, the desire was to hold on to the middle school model. I, I don't think I got that wrong. Um, so that has to be factored into all of this. And what I would like to just share with, remind the board that you will still have opportunities to bring forth these, the, the things that are, that you, that you would like to see. This is simply a structure to our framework to start building the budget. You will have ample opportunities to bring all this stuff forward again. Now, I would not be supporting, um, I mean, I support moving sixth graders to middle school within the middle school model. I mean, we can't, because we know that that works for our kids. We know from, we have three schools that it's working. Now that's, that. so I would not be supporting anything to get rid of middle school if anything, I would want it to be, um, I mean, we would look to see how we can improve the experience for kids in the middle. Uh, Cause I don't, I, and, and it will be a phased in project just because of its magnitude. Dr. Bryant. And Madam President, uh, just for the record, the administration did express today that it's also supportive of sixth graders moving to middle school um, simply because of potential academic benefits looking beyond just the fiscal implications, particularly if there's a path towards doing this um, in a more cost neutral manner, given a potential PTR increase. So that was mentioned in the work session earlier, and I wanted to just state that for the record tonight. Thank you. Member Lessons. I have a question or point of information. I'm hoping that somebody could speak to the hypothetical of using a board supermajority to approve a fund balance use below 8%, so specifically 7%. Um, when would a supermajority, when would you need that authority and what are the um, risks and benefits of using $5.6 million more in our fund balance towards this? That's right. Sure. Uh, Mr. Anderson, would you? Uh, that is certainly something we can look forward to. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So, um, board would not have to decide that tonight. Mm -hmm. um, the board could decide that when they approve the preliminary budget in February. At at uh, at the end of tonight, what would be nice is to know that the um, administration has some flexible use of funds. And we may come back with um, a recommendation that the board can amend, reject, um, come up with a whole new one, probably won't come up with a whole new preliminary budget. Um, but but if we're short 6 million or 8 million, 
Um, we could wait until February to have that discussion as to whether 3 million could come from fund balance and 4 million could come from state bond debt reimbursement. Um, but if you take it out of fund balance below 8%, it will take a super majority, um, which is, is fine. That's acceptable, but it doesn't have to be made tonight. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we are back to, oh, I see more lights. Um, I had one follow-up oh, question. Oh, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, it was a second sort of point of information. Um, with the $2.1 million in administrative cuts, um, do we have a sense, does the administration yet have a sense of what positions would be eliminated um, with those cuts? I guess I would find it somewhat concerning if, you know, one person is going to be asked then to do the full, full-time full employment of two people. Yeah, That seems challenging. And for that reason, that, that's why the administration appreciates the opportunity to discuss amongst leadership exactly what we can comfortably propose as a cut that won't jeopardize the operations or compliance regulations for the district. That's very important. And those conversations happened with that 2.1 million. If the board were to, for example, request more cuts to administration, we'd need to go through that process again. And we wouldn't expect the board to have to decide which positions and which departments. We really do as an administrative team need to determine that based on all of the different um, factors when it comes to compliance and legal regulation and other things to keep the district afloat. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Let's come over here. I think, who did I see? Uh, yeah, Member Donnelly. Thank you, Madam President. I I understand that this resolution tonight doesn't, or is it a resolution? Yeah, it doesn't foreclose future amendments, changes, being yeah. proposed future amendments, but at the same time, it does offer positions that we're taking at this time. Um, I, at our Saturday meeting, I, I did express concern with the pupil teacher ratio increase. And I believe I campaigned on this being something I was going to work really hard to uh, keep as low as possible. So I don't agree with this projected pupil teacher ratio increase and I would move to delete it. There's a motion to delete the one uh, P PTR ratio. Is there a second? Not hearing one, let's move on. Member Higgins. Thank you. I, I, rather than pushing complete motion, since this is not a binding here, I just want to talk about a few points of where I'm going to have problems next week so you know it up front. With pupil, pupil teacher ratio as far as being for kindergarten, first, second grade, we, pushing it on the, on the, that level, given the impact it has on the low levels compared to others, the studies I've seen coming from NSBA makes me very concerned. Okay. So putting it all those grades, it, it uh, some studies with, I know in Philadelphia showed if you do real low grades on K12 that um, uh, you accomplish, you know, 90% of what you had for low, low pupil tissue ratios for all grades. So put that, that's a real concern to me, how we distribute that, uh, okay. within the issue. And I'm, I'm not going to be supportive of, of elimination of, of Abbott Loop. Um, it's a permanent decision making. We don't know what's going to happen with the state funding. We're laying it out there. I'll tell you what, the public needs to know that if we don't get funding from the state this year, if we don't see the real changes here next year, we're not going to be saying no to things. We're going to be adding things that's going to shock people. We don't have a choice because we will have to make such drastic cuts that it will be there. But we, we, so some of these are going to be reversible if we get money from the state. And if cutting Abbott Loop is one that's, that's becomes, once you do it, it becomes a non reversible. Even if you get the additional funds, you're going to be headed in that direction. So I'm concerned about that, uh, in regards to it. Um, uh, I do agree with the, um, uh, Ignite program. We don't want to touch that. <laughs> and I appreciate the language in there, the fact that you added it in there. Uh, at all. Uh, I have real problems with the, um, um, you know, the, the, the band and everything else that we're talking about cutting. But, you know, it's, 
for the purposes of what we're doing, if we get funding from the state, that may be the first thing we're adding back in uh, or things that we're doing. If we're moving sixth grade into middle school, that kind of eliminates that issue anyway. That's true. So um, I, I look forward to the to the administration coming forward, listening to these issues in regards to coming up with something, knowing this is not a definitive this is not. action at this particular point. So I'm not going to get into motions one after the other today because really it's going to be hashed out next meeting uh, at that point. But I appreciate the fact that they're having the meeting, they're throwing this out here. Uh, the state bond debt reimbursement is a is a filler <laughs> for the budget maybe is what we may have to have if we don't agree upon what to cut. But we'll decide that next okay. meeting and I think it's, it's a good attempt to try to do something and I appreciate that. And uh, it, I would thank you, Member Higgins. I'd like to remind the board members also that I did send you a relatively uh, flexible timeline that kind of shows our progress uh, between now and March 1st so that you could see um, that we're, you know, what are those next steps? So January is the budget bill month. Uh, within, before they begin to build the budget, they want to have the, the individual meetings with uh, each of us or uh, in pairs, whatever you decide, then you can lay your particulars on the table, those things that you kind of want to see or the things that are missing for you or the things that you, hopefully you're sending in your questions as they come up relative to what things cost. Um, but that timeline is kind of the next steps for, for this process. And so, but no, this does not, this is advisory. It's guidance to the staff so that they can bring something back to us and when that comes back we get to have another deeper discussion um with the goal of getting to 48 million and the other thing i'd like to share regardless i mean even if we get to 48 million this year we we have lost five thousand students they are not all going to come back. We are going to be back here next year and the year after. We are going to have to deal with consolidating our schools, right-sizing our, our infrastructure. It's not going to go away. So we are kicking that can down the road. I get it. Um, I think we can probably stand on Abbott Loop and see, what is it, Kasun? Because it's in that same neighborhood. The receiving schools for Abbott Loop are Kassoon for about 170 students, according to my notes, and about 40 students to Trailside. To Trailside, based yes. on okay. Avenue. So you can't see Trailside from from standing on the roof, but you can see Kassoon. So they share the same community. That did that did uh, factor into my decision. Anyway, um, so this is a advisory memo giving guidance to the superintendent. And I'm going to call the question, guys, unless you yeah, Dr. Brian. And I, I did just want to clarify specifically on the topic of school closures. That is something that would need to be decided tonight. Should the board decide to not close any schools, um, we don't anticipate coming back next month with a school closure. We truly do need the time to finalize a budget book that includes every school that will be on our roster going into next year. Um, so I just want the board to know that a vote to not opt for school closures tonight will likely mean no school closures this year so i just wanted us to be informed on that beyond, that, yeah, that is a little more that. decisional but you got be abbott loop included if abbott loop if there's no decision on abbott loop tonight it won't come back next month we really need to know specifically on school closures tonight just in, in terms of the timing that jim has shared with regards to putting together the budget book so that one's a little bit more time sensitive than the others so, yes so if if we vote yes on this document as it sits we will see a school closure at our next meeting or maybe. So if you did vote on this memo, that would provide the administration guidance that that would include the closure of Abbott Loop and we would begin planning the HR processes as applicable for staff, the budgetary processes for the school. Transition. Transitioning a school out of a district takes many months and we would take the decision to uh, adopt the memo as written very seriously and begin conversations with staff. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Member Higgins. Well, let me pull it up real quick. 
in that case, I'll go ahead and let's bring it to a vote because I'm going to move that um, uh, we remove, let me get the right language in here, um, school closure savings of 974000 from this proposal. Second. So it's moved and second to remove Abbott Loop from the list. Correct. Any other discussion before we vote? God, this has just been such a hard project <laughs> here. Um, with a decrease, continued decrease in population, the consol future consolidation of schools is, uh, unless there's drastic change in the population of, of, of kids in Anchorage, I just don't see that at this point changing. I see that we're going to have to move towards consolidating schools and with going from six to one school, um, although every one of them is, is heartbreaking for me, it is the opportunity to give those kids at, at Abbott Loop and their transition full focus. So, I mean, it's like having one-on-one -on -one attention in, in some regard. And I, I think that opportunity, given that we are going to have to at least in my mind, move towards future consolidation of schools. I think it's the op I, I think it's an opportunity um, to focus on a great transition for those kids and for the receiving schools, um, especially given that that's where we're going to have to move towards if again, if the population trend doesn't change. Um, so I, I see that we can we can make it a positive. Um, a positive transition and a positive opportunity for those kids in the receiving schools as well. Um, yeah. I'm just going to say it's all it's all heartbreaking though. Yes. Okay. We just heard from you, Member Holliman. I, I was going to say I appreciate the detail that Superintendent Bryant put into it. Um, our budget doesn't really become final until January, or February, which means March, April, May from making those plans and doing whatever we can do to transition those kids. Um, so in essence, I'm suggesting that we make it March, April, May, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, and make sure we really get it right. Oh, I, okay. I do believe that Abbott Loop is a school that, that the cause of the capital needs is gonna be closed. I do think there will be more to follow. Um, to me, I would much rather nail it the first time and use that as a model as opposed to making a list of things that we would have done if we'd had more time in uh, in trying to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Member Lessons? And then I'm coming to this side. So I've spoken, I think, here and elsewhere about an idea that I don't know if anybody else supports, and that is moving downsizing out of the Ed Center, which is a convenient consolidated space um, in which, you know, a parent who needs help can come into the building and go upstairs or downstairs or to the left or to the right, and all the resources are here. But it's expensive. And one opportunity is to use ASD property to diminish the um, financial costs of having an administration space. And so, I guess my question is, is the prospect of moving the administration's office partially into Abbott Loop even plausible? Or is it, is it not? Uh, through the president to um, member lessons, a couple of points on this. So we have discussed this in the past, and the reason why we don't have a firm proposal for the Ed Center is really down to two reasons. Okay. One is that the oh, lease for the Ed Center has not expired at this point, so that's one consideration. So there would be potential um, costs if we were to exit the lease early. And two, at this point, there is no building to move the Ed Center at period. So that really rests even on this very decision tonight about do we even have a building um, that's available for the Ed Center. And I would say the the third factor
factor would probably be the added cost of renovating any building, including Abbott Loop, to accommodate um, the various needs of of an ed center, including a boardroom, for example, and adequate parking and other considerations to where, frankly, it would take a number of months to give the board a proposal um, for consideration for something that complex, especially when we don't currently have a building to use at this moment until the board makes some decisions on school closures. Uh, Jim, did I miss anything? No, that was good. Um, you know, we have looked at this and talked about it frequently. Um, it really is going to take um, probably the equivalent of a middle school and an elementary school um, for us to completely relocate the Ed Center. Uh, years ago, they were in five different locations with five different leases. Um, there were a lot of challenges, so they consolidated into one building. We cannot get out of this lease until June of 25. So we have time to come up with a long-term, deliberate, um, staffed plan to figure out what to do with the Ed Center, but it can't be by next fall, or we're going to have to pay the Ed Center lease and the millions of dollars in renovations to put a portion of the Ed Center into Abbott Loop. It needs a little over $4 million to raise the roof and put a fire suppression system in. Um, we'll need um, a certain amount of money just to be able to redesign it to pick a portion of the Ed Center. But at the end of the day, it's only going to cost us more if we do that. So moving the Ed Center needs to be a, a very deliberate plan as opposed to maybe an amendment plan where we make a quick amendment and now we're stuck. It, it wouldn't be a good path forward. And Highland Academy shares this building with us. They only rolled over $31,000 last year. If they don't have the advantage of a building, because now we've potentially not closed any schools, so we have nothing to offer them, um, Highline Academy won't be around very long. They, they just won't be solvent. Um, we already helped them a little bit with their lease at 75,000 a year for the portion that they're using. Um, it, it has much bigger impacts than can we use Abbott Loop and put HR and, and maybe another staff department there for a cost of several million. We 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 legitimately risk losing a, a charter school with with that decision. So we need to look at moving Highland Academy or finding a place for them as part of moving the Ed Center. And you know, this is an uncomfortable discussion in public, but but those are the facts and those are real. And we just approved a 10 year charter renewal for Highland only to potentially um, make them homeless. Okay, thank you. Member Higgins. Let me um, address some of the capital investment with Abbott because I've attended community councils on a regular basis. And, and I recall the discussion at one point in order to meet the new fire codes, a new roof need to be raised and the cost was so great that the only option really was to go ahead and build a new school. Then the administration came back to the to the um, Abbott Loop Community Council, said that was presented then, but it's not the case now. And you can they can address this relatively inexpensively on the roof, and they had a lower cost, and they they could address it. And so it didn't need all the capital investment that was told at one time. It's much lower, and that they can maintain it and meet the code and go forward. So just to share with you, over time that number has dwindled dramatically, okay, as far as maintaining that school from a cost standpoint. Uh, it was frustrating to me because uh, 10 years ago, it was like you had to build a new, but then it all changed with the with the approach that they took. So I don't think we're dealing with that bigger issue. We see the issue of the cost of the school closures, and we saw the analysis in here with the six and how much it started with some, and at the end of that five-year period, some of them were actually a deficit, you know, because it wasn't the savings, it was the opposite. So you got some alternatives here as to what's going to end up coming out of it. The idea that if you don't close the school, you don't save any money. We're going to be saving money that's dramatic compared to the to the savings involved in closing a school that provides some some savings it has a big impact 
We talk about the equity. We talk about involvement with parents, which a tremendous impact on outcomes is involvement with parents. You talk about attendance, you talk about other issues. Uh, it's going to make a difference. So I'm concerned about that aspect of it big time. I'm, I'm in favor of change. <laughs> Believe me, I, I am dramatically in favor of change, but I need, we need to see a lot of systemic changes in the school district to get the academic scores up and just closing schools isn't going to do it by itself. And I'm concerned that the impact on the community, the vo the public has been very, very vocal on these issues of what's going on, how it impacts them and their kids and all they're fighting for it. Um, and that's why I'm supporting the idea of not closing it at this time. If, if we don't get funding from the state, I know everything will be on the plate everything we talked about this year and a lot more. Okay, it's gonna happen. The fact that we're using reserves right now, we won't have all those reserves next year. So if the so if the legislature and the governor doesn't come through, we're gonna be in bad shape. But I'm not gonna, I don't wanna burn bridges and say we have to do something that's irreversible. And that's why I'm concerned that Abbott Loop throwing it under the bus right now, um, uh, simply as a symbolic for legislators for any other reason, is out there and we don't have a plan to use it. We don't have a transition right now. It is, uh, member lessons, I agree. If we're gonna look at schools, let's make sure that when we do it, we have a plan like moving uh, optional program, I mean, the charter schools into things and, and using it for administration. And I just don't think it's there in this regard. We don't have a plan for it. So I'm, I'm going to obviously support what I moved. Uh, but I just did the act, the, the cost associated with the school from the information directly from the administration to the community council is a lot different than what we heard at one time. And I think that's very important. Okay. Member Jacobs. Yeah. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I think it, uh, this amendment's interesting <clears throat> and I've expressed some concern about the six to middle in part because I'm, I'm focused and uh, maybe just how I'm wired is looking you know, two to five years ahead um, by approving that move. And, and there's very solid academic reasons for doing so, to be clear. Um, we are going down a road uh, where we will be, um, this district will be faced with closing many more elementary schools in the years to come. Um, you know, I think we, we heard earlier in our work session that there might be a list of 12 at some point, and we're grappling here with one, which is great. I think we should. This is, it's a serious decision, but um, there's some cognitive dissonance there, I guess. I'm not sure I understand, um, and I, I feel like at the rate that we're using uh, reserves in the form of fund balance and one-time federal funds and one-time state funds, um, our, our closure, our school closure path and our funding path um, aren't in alignment. And so I, I'm still trying to work through that. With that said, I, I think what I heard Member Holloman um, say when in support of Member Higgins' motion was, you know, in essence, let, let's focus on asking um, the board to allow students at Abbott Loop to have one more year of, of normalcy. Um, I guess I'm curious if to to the maker and the seconder of this motion, if they would consider instead, if that's the goal, um, modifying the amendment to just change the FY23 uh, in the in that paragraph to FY24, um, it wouldn't make it entirely germane to this memo. But there's also language in here that speaks towards ignite and. Um, you know, it, it not being a, a reduction. And so I guess I'm curious if that's the intent of the amendment or if the amendment is to take Abbott Loop out of the closure conversation for years to come. Because I think that might be guidance the district might value too. And so just looking to understand. Thank you. Um, Member Higgins as the maker of the motion. Yeah, if I can respond to that. I, I think if, if we send it forward to FY24, what does that tell the administration? That we're going to definitely support it. It's going to be all de dependent upon how much funds we get from the state, what we've got. Everything we do today for developing the budget next year is going to be based upon state funding and all the other issues. But would putting it in FY24, would that, would the administration be taking steps today with the idea of it being a year and a half away? I, 
through the president to member Higgins, I think it adds another layer of complexity. It blurs the lines between round one and round two. And uh, to a point made earlier today at the dais, it does add um, an extension of the levels of anxiety to the school community. So I think for that reason, it's something that we should do very cautiously, if at all, um, because another option is just to completely remove Abbott Loop from the conversation. And then we can come back with a fresh round of schools if that's the desire of the board. Thank you. Did you get your answer, Member Jacobs? I'd be curious to hear from Member Holloman. I guess I'll add just briefly as a follow-up to Member Higgins' point and to Dr. Bryan's point. Um, by having 19 schools, elementary schools below 65% capacity, I hope no one's pretending that's not going to cause anxiety. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure. I guess I don't understand that point. Um, I feel like we it, there's a strategic planning element that comes in place, too, where we, we owe the public um, a certain level of discourse as to the road we're on as well. And so I think there's two sides of that coin. But I, I do value hearing from Member Holloman as well. As Member a seconder Holland. of the motion. Um, yeah, I, I think it is something with a number of edges on it. And and one is that if people do believe it's inevitable, naturally staff are going to begin to think about their future and where they're going to be and whether or not they want to stay to the very end and possibly risk uh, involuntary placement or um, whatever happens to be available, They're, most teachers, I think, would start looking maybe for something close to their house, maybe in their own child school or, or other things. And it does have a corrosive effect. But at the same time, um, this is something we've not done before. Um, and I think it might be in the tradition of the Anchorage School District just to tell people it's closed and have them figure out the best way to do it. But I hope we've moved into a different time where we really take care with our families and and I think doing one school carefully. And I'm not so sure we have the time to do it this year. Um, your point's well taken about the number of schools we've got to have extra capacity. And I, I suspect that the things that are driving Abbott Loop as the first choice won't change a lot between now and sometime next year um and I, I think a lot of people at abbott loop understand that as well so i um given the number of schools that we may be looking at overall i i think it does make sense that the administration may put together a team of people that become proficient at this which i have to admit is a job i hope i i'm glad that i got through my career in academics without ever having to be on a, a group like that, but in doing it right and in, in looking ahead as far as we can and trying to figure out who needs to be touched, which parents need guidance to continue getting the help they need, um, what makes the most sense in terms of um, funding and how we redirect, how we redraw boundaries, how we place kids in different places. And I, I would hate to see us do all that quickly. I would like to see us do it carefully with the understanding that it's something we're going to be doing again and again and again and again, um, but over the next five or six years, um, not and not necessarily starting in January and having it done by the end of May. So the motion before you, I'm sorry. So I'm going to uh, ask the board. Uh, we have a person in the uh, audience who would like to speak. Is there any opposition to that? Yeah. I thought all you have to do is say, Member Donnelly. Okay. As a point of order, I don't recall that. Your mic's off, Andy. I, I, I don't recall that we had a public hearing on this motion. Someone would have to look at the minutes. That we had a public hearing on. Did, yeah, did we allow for public, public comment, comment on comment? this motion? Uh, because it was on the consent agenda, we moved it to action mm -hmm. uh, because it was time sensitive. Right. And it represents guidance, advisory. 
but that should have precipitated public comment. I agree with that. If we didn't have public comment, then, then we ought to have public comment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the action agenda now. Is there any board opposition to Mr. Anks coming to speak before us? No, my opposition is to an individual, but it should be open for public comment. It is, okay. And if he'd like to comment, then he can comment under public comment. And I, and I can I can do that part. You the one, you raised a, 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 a situation which we were trying to help clarify for you. Mr. Anks, will you come forward, please? Thank you for your patience. Yes. I really appreciate the conversation about Abbott Loop. That's that was why I moved to the front of the room uh, specifically. Uh, I would be um, in favor of the motion. Uh, I believe that our students, our families, our community has been through a lot over the last several years. And I believe another, uh, I don't know how long, year or two years of stability could really provide uh, academic outcomes for those students. And we have chosen, you have chosen potentially to take all the other five schools off uh, of the closure list. So I would appreciate you also considering taking Abbott Loop off the closure list. In addition, I want to um, emphasize, re-emphasize kind of what, what member Jacobs uh, was speaking to, and that is uh, moving sixth graders to middle mm -hmm. school. That will change the capacity levels at all of our elementaries and you will all be taking this on. And there may be a broader strategy to consider in regards to how, which schools um, you will be considering consolidating due to just this sixth grade move. It does, that's a, it's a huge thing on capacity levels for all of our elementary schools that still have sixth graders. So I appreciate the conversation. Uh, I'm here to advocate for the students who are um, who will take another dip uh, when the move happens? It just you know all the research shows it. Any any uh, type of significant um, significance to their to their normalcy to their lives uh, generally precipitates a, a learning outcome dip. So uh, in in that regard, uh, I would ask you all to be in favor of this motion and let's just let's. Let's take the sixth grade move. Let's look at capacity levels of the district as a whole. I think there's a really good example that was shared during the work session of what's going to happen out in Eagle River. And that's going to happen across the whole Muni uh, once we move those sixth graders. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So with that, it's there any other board member who would like to speak to the motion? Thank you. All right. So now let's continue. Member lessons. This is an incredibly challenging conversation. A um, million dollars in considering the magnitude of the rest of our deficit seems not very much, right? We're not going to gain that much ground. But on the other hand, it's very real. Those are real positions. Those are real uh, maybe class sizes that we're going to be compensating with. Um, you know, on to the suggestion, to the memo before, to the motion before us, if we were to remove um, Abbott Loop from from memo ninety four, um, what that does for this year's there are fourth graders and fifth graders this year at Abbott Loop who will experience a double disruption. This year's fifth graders at Abbott Loop, if we were to move forward with transitioning them to Kassoon and Trailside, we'll move once to sixth grade and once again to seventh grade. This year's fourth graders at Abbott Loop would have a year of stability, a year or two of stability. Um, this year's fourth graders, they'd be fifth graders at a new school and then probably again pivot by that point, Hanshu would be six through eight. So this year's fourth graders and fifth graders at Abbott Loop would experience a double disruption. However, we would have less of a disruption, right? We wouldn't disrupt this year's fifth graders doubly if we waited a year 
because they would go, they would stay at Abbott Loop and then they would move to middle school with Hanshu just being seven, eight. And this year's fourth graders would become fifth graders. And then they would just move to a sixth grade at Hanshu. If I have the sequential sixth grade expansion at Hanshu correctly. So basically we would, by buying a year, we avoid a double disruption cost for this year's fourth graders and fifth graders at Avalu. That's pretty dialed in. So um, on one hand, we can avoid that. On the other hand, I'm thinking about the, you know, research that I found that yes, there is a disruption cost. It exists when students are displaced in these consolidations. However, the magnitude of the disruption is not larger than something that can be compensated for by class sizes or teach additional supports to teachers aides. So to the conversation point earlier, Member Wilson shared, if we put additional resources into the receiving schools, I think we can do a really good job for those students. So I, I'm torn. I guess I'm just sharing all that to say that I'm torn. Thank you. Uh, Member Jacobs. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. Um, so I think there's been a lot of conversation from at least Member Holloman about timeline. And so um, I understand that, Dr. Bryant, that if we um, leave Abbott Loop off um, of Memo 94, that um, that decision has been made for the year. If we leave Abbott Loop on, um, it'll be before us again in February, at which point we'll have the chance to reconsider. And then even after that, I think that there's um, a date in early May, at which point um, that is statistic or is relevant from a calendar perspective, uh, from at least a contract um, perspective. And then I, I guess I'm curious as to at what point can, not just for this item, but I mean, we're going to be grappling with other closures in the years to come, clearly, because um, we haven't heard significant disagreement on the sixth of middle school. Um, at what point can the brakes no longer be placed um, if, if the legislature passes a one-time funding bill with clear articulation that a BSA increase and inflation proofing um, appear evident by mid-April? Um, can the brakes be applied on a process or is that too too late for school closures? From through the president to member Jacobs, in my view, it would be extremely disruptive to keep Abbott Loop on the memo, approve that tonight, and then in February have a conversation about removing a school for a number of reasons. Um, that's not something the administration would recommend. I would recommend that if a board member um, does not feel comfortable at this point to approve the closure of Abbott Loop, then vote no on the current amendment on the floor. That would be the administration's recommendation, and of course, th that's the decision of the board. Madam President, might I follow up? Yes, you may. I appreciate your um, recommendation. My question to you was a little different. Um, if the board approves a memo 94 with Abbott Loop on it tonight, at what point do we cross the, the point of no return where um, even if the legislature comes through with additional funding, um, even if there are other um, reasons which make um, the closure no longer um, advantageous in the, in the best interest of the district, what date is that I would say that this is the point of no return, which is why since July we've mentioned that December 19th would be the day that we need to make a decision on school closures because we need to finalize the budget book. We need to uh, really ensure that we have a sound transition for students and staff. There are a number of HR and operational and frankly academic processes that we would need to think seriously through. Um, so to make a decision stating that the board is um, providing guidance on a closure and then even if there were more money to come in the equation, I think the level of disruption at that point um, would not be favorable for students and, and families. That, that's my recommendation. So I have my question. Um, I think the status for Abbott Loop was to demolish it. Is that correct? Because of its state of disrepair or need for capital improvement. It would be um, marked as excess, and then from there, it would be in the court of the municipality to make that final determination. Right. So, so my question. So, so I guess I'm just. I, I need some uh, input as to leaving kids in that building for another year, if that's the will of the board. What does that? How much money do we need to fix it up? So we will not just put, we will not just take 
a, a million dollars off the table, we would have to put something amount of money in there to keep kids in it, right? Well, we, we do have the bond approved $4 million to lift the roof and put a fire suppression system in. I guess that what makes this question difficult is normally in districts that put a list of schools out for potential closure, they frequently will put out a double jeopardy clause that says, if it made it through this run, then we won't look at that school again for X number of years. Mm. In the case where all six did, don't make it, does that mean that all six for three years or five years or X number of years are, are now off the table for discussion? And the reason they do the double jeopardy rule or clause when they do this is because if next year, if we bring these exact same communities in for a town hall and we want input and feedback, you're going to have someone now will have gone through it twice in a row. Um, and it's apparently a very unpleasant situation for all involved. Um, and when you talk about the trauma of moving students and the discussions and the teachers tonight talking about the 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 stress that's why most districts will will not bring those schools back up again um, at least the following year and start all over so when you ask what would need to be done it, it would depend we would need far we would need more decisions later on to determine are they off the list are they off the table for five years if that's what the board wants if they do we need to put a we need to raise the roof and put a fire suppression system and that's $4 million of what? A little bit over. Right. Okay. Okay. Oh, uh, I just want to call our attention to the time. We'll have to extend shortly. Uh, member um, Holloman. And, and I was just going to say, I understand what Mr. Anderson's saying. In this case, we're specifically delaying by year, though. I, I don't hear anybody on the board talking about Abbott Loop may not be the right one to close, but rather we we haven't done this we haven't done a closure and that the time frame may be different we're coming off covid we're coming off disruptive years um i i think part of the argument i've heard from people in the community is could we have two relatively normal years in a row and and i i think it would be fair to say we'd be going into next year expecting it to close unless something remarkable happened and and I don't think any of us expect that. Okay. Member Jacobs. Yeah, thank you, Madam President. I guess I'll just um, go back to my question earlier, which was if we're, we're, we're saying this is only for a year, I'm very concerned about something Dr. Bryan touched on, which is um, we're going to be saying the, the school would be off the table when we intend to, at least a couple members intend to bring it forward next year. And so, I feel like we should make a decision at this point if this is a um, if there's a moratorium on on Abbott Loop, um, along with the other schools, but Abbott Loop isn't before us right now um, for just a year, or if it's longer. And I, I'm not saying that either one's wrong, but I feel like the the messaging on this is is pretty confusing to the. If I were a teacher at Abbott Loop, I'm not sure what the plan is mm -hmm. um, based on just this amendment. Um, and I think we owe it to the community to be clear. And that's that's why I was hoping that changing FY23 to FY24, based on the words of members Higgins and Holloman, captured the intent of what they were trying to accomplish. If their intent is to not close Abbott Loop at all, I think that's a, that's a conversation that we can absolutely have. I'm just asking for that clarity for the staff and the students and the families who um, attend that school. Uh, Member Higgins. Let me say that I understand and I appreciate Mr. Anderson talking about a three year period and that cycle. I don't view this vote. I don't view the vote on the other five schools as that. 
we're voting on budget kind of issues, whatever schools, if we are closing schools next year with the budget, we don't get the support from the administ- from the legislature and the governor, and we have to cut schools. We ought to pick the schools that are the most logical, even if we've talked about them once and we pulled back this year. That doesn't mean that some other school has to replace it if it's not the best for the kids. We got Everything's got to be focused on kids, right? And whatever school is going to cause the least disruption is what we need to go forward with. The question is right now, do we need to go Go forward with Abbott Luke this year. We don't know what's going to happen with the legislature. Every year that we change, you're absolutely right. We just went through the pandemic. We got all these other disruptions going on out there. We postponed it a year. Is it beneficial for kids? I think it is. Um, and we have a little bit more flexibility and looking at options in regards to the budget and what we can do and, and what types of cuts we got to do. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get money this year and we'll actually have more in reserves and make other changes so we can actually help the following year. But I, I don't view this as an absolute once, if we don't vote right now, have it loose off for three years or that thought or any school is off for three years. If we have to look at school closures, they're all there. I just see this as beneficial from the kids standpoint at this time, not to push this through. And I, that's the reason why I'm pushing what I am. So I just want to be uh, remind us that we will be closing schools. We're going to be right back here next year, even if we if we get because we don't have the students and they're not all coming from one neighborhood. They're coming from all over the bowl. So we are going to be closing schools. Point of information, Madam Remember, President, do we need a, a motion to extend now or is it a, a little? Uh, we can we can go to 11. OK, thank you. Member Wilson, I, I just want to clarify because something I that was said, and, and I wrote it down uh, because it was a bit of a gut punch to me, was that looking at closing Abbott Loop was potentially a symbolic um, cut to be made. And and it's not. I mean, I, I don't do anything symbolic that affects mm-hmm. our kids. There's there's no cuts that I'm I'm that are being proposed in my mind, or I'm even considering that. I'm trying to make a point with, right? I mean, this, these, these are real cuts affecting real families, real kids and real staff. And so I, I just wanted to make that clear that nothing we're doing here is symbolic. I mean, I it, it's truly heart wrenching that we have to make all these cuts that the funding is is what it is. And I'll, although I, I really, I, I hope that the community truly advocates for additional funding, then legislature comes through with that. But I, I'm I'm looking at realistically what we're dealing with today and, and the balanced budget that we have to move forward. So I I just wanted to make it clear that there is in my mind nothing symbolic being done regarding these cuts. Thank you, Member Wilson. Seeing no other comments, the motion before you is to remove the paragraph titled school closure for $974,000. Uh, I meant, oh, mm-hmm. So point of clarification, are we, are, are Member Higgins, are you allowing that language change to be changed from, was that 23 to 24? I'm not or are sure. you asking that Abbott Loop be completely removed from no, any options? I'm, or any I'm not options? changing it to the next year. I'm asking just to remove it. And I think that's what the administration has indicated too. If we're not putting this over somebody's head, if we're going to cut it next year, you don't put it over the head right now. You're not accomplishing anything positive for the for the community or the kids so, or for anything else. So I, I'm recommending removal. Period. Okay, uh, we, uh, Member Jacobs, and then we're going we're going to vote. Thank you, Madam President. I I respect Member Higgins greatly, and I I think I understand where he's coming from with this point. But we just had a board member um, indicate that that's the intention, and so I I think it's almost intellectually dishonest to pretend as if it won't be a serious option next year when it's been part of our discussion now for the last half hour. So because of the lack of clarity, minutes. but who's counting? Um, because of that lack of clarity. Um, I can't support this amendment. I think our our kids deserve better. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to call for the question. You ready, Amanda? For the vote, yeah. 
Member Donnelly? No. Member Higgins? Yes. Member Holloman? Yes. Member Jacobs? No. Member Lessons? No. Member Wilson? No. President Bellamy? No. Okay, that fails. Um, five to two. All right, so we are back to the main motion, or uh, not motion. We're back to the guidance, the advisory, as it as it is has been amended. I see two mics on down here. Which go go go, Member Jacobs. I'll, I'll speak just generally to the point about sixth grade to middle school. Again, I remain concerned um, about. The lack of, well, I think the lack of broad understanding as to um, what that means for our community in terms of elementary capacity, and I don't think this board's even been briefed on, on a, a map of which schools are below that capacity, and so I will tentatively um, support the, the transition knowing that um, I might object later, and I understand that that might not in, uh, it might be an inconvenience to administration, but um, I'm going to be looking for a detailed plan as to how we're going to incorporate sixth graders into middle school and how we're going to um, engage in a process that um, facilitates quality education at under capacity elementary schools across the district um, or um, a, a plan, the, the plan which the board will support, which will um, help draw down the number of campuses in line with our current student population. Um, we, I think we have to, to pick one of those two. And, and there's inevitably a funding component, uh, which hopefully the legislature will provide clarity on. Um, but I, I need more info and I'm still very much uneasy about that point. But um, I'll also add, I guess, while I'm, yeah, I appreciate we've had great discussion tonight. So thank you for the, the thoughts and amendments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Likewise, I'd like more information. I'm not going to take it off the uh, memorandum, but um, I would like more information on ASD virtual secondary. So when I come for my budget conference, I'd want to hear more about that. Um, any other comments? Member uh, Don Lee, Member Higgins, is your uh, mic just on? Did you have, did you want to speak? Or you you can go after Member Don Lee. Okay. Thank you. You go. Thank you, Madam President. All these options, I, I think, as 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 uh, has been said before by other members, none of these are good choices. They're all really difficult, and um, the most difficult for when for me is the uh, pupil teacher ratio because I I set that as a priority. Um, and I, I, I have a rule that I stick by things I said I'd do in a campaign. And in a campaign, I said I'd prioritize that. So I'm, I can't vote for this overall package. There's a lot of things in here I would support cutting. Um, and there's things in here that I've advocated for cutting for every year I've been here. Um, so, um, but to have it all rolled together with, with something that I strongly disagree with is makes it uh, ultimately the total package unacceptable to me. But, I, but I, we don't have the total package. We have a, a framework to build, and then you get to bring your voice to that yeah. again in the future. Yeah, I just, promise. <laughs> yeah. I know you, you, you do that in goodwill, but I'm fearful that when the time comes, people will say, well, the board recommended these things, you know, and that, that'll be the argument rather than being based on the merits. I hope that the argument when we come to make the final decision is based on the merits and not what happens. Right, but you, we, we don't get to anticipate how people are yeah. going to vote. We just yeah. get to bring our yeah. voice to the vote. Well, I'm just explaining. So I, I hear my what you're voice, saying. My vote is being driven by the pupil-teacher ratio. So when you, um, so for tonight, though, we, it's part of the memo for guidance. If that ends up coming off, then we got to figure out how we're going to 
what what where that other seven million is going to come from? And at our meeting, I proposed many additional cuts, getting close to making up that seven million. Right. Those, I understand that yeah. the majority of the board didn't support those. That's I, I I understand that. That's the majority. But you rules. get to bring it back. Yes. Okay. All right. Member I just want to say I've campaigned a lot recently, and <laughs> I'm not doing that right now, but. Um, I don't want to increase the PTR. I don't think any, I don't think any person on up on the dais or, or over on the administration side wants to increase the PTR. But the reality is we are, um, we're moving a few pennies around when, when the reality is we don't have enough pennies to make a dollar. And until something changes for our revenue streams, all seven of us are going to have to make cuts that may well go deeply against what we hold dear. Thank you, Member Lessons. So we are uh, ready to uh, vote on the the guidance uh, with the uh, as amended, so that we can get a document in front of us. A question, Madam President, if I might. Sure. Um, administration mentioned and referenced getting guidance on the other other closures in terms of if there would be a moratorium on them. When does administration need that guidance and have we developed a process for what that might look like? Um, so I, actually, I'll defer to Jim if he has a particular um, position that I'll add. I I think it can wait. Um, we we will obviously continue looking at schools for closure. We will have some time now that um, all six schools are off the list for this year. Um, I believe. Oh no, it didn't make it. That's right. Oh. It was. It's everything else was voted out. But um, so we'll we'll come back with. We don't want to surprise people when we start next fall or this summer with what the ground rules are, so we have time. Thank you. Did that answer your question? It does. I, I hope as part of this process, maybe it's an addendum to our budget. Maybe it's a, a work session we have towards the end of the year. I would like to have kind of a post-mortem for our FY24 budget and look at the short list for way ahead of time where we're going to start the conversation um, the following fall. I think that's another way we can be transparent and accessible. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's vote on um, the main, I mean, the guidance, uh, memorandum 094, the guidance. Member Lessons? Yes. Member Wilson? Yes. Member Higgins? Member Holloman? Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Donley? No. President Bellamy? Yes. And that passes uh, six to one. Oh, thank you. Now we're moving on to item G. Um, oh, those are non-action items. It'll come, that item will come back to you next at our next meeting. We have no additional public comment. We are now at the superintendent's update. I know it's getting late and I wish I could say that I um, could be brief tonight, um, but I know um, there are a couple things that the public wants to, to hear me speak to. <laughs> um, Take your time. Yeah, so this is going to be a little dense and you'll understand why in just a moment. Um, but, you know, I guess to, to start off, I can't believe it's nearly the new year. Um, 
I've spent many recent nights um, reflecting on my first six months as superintendent. And in short, I truly feel blessed to be a member of Team ASD and in the Anchorage community. And were there some curveballs that were thrown along the way? Absolutely. Um, but through all the challenges, it's clear that we are a resilient community that loves our schools. Um, so before I share a couple of reflections um, on this year, um, let me just address the elephant in the room. Um, which is the snow days. <laughs> so back in November, uh, actually here at the dais, I joked um, that my healing from the warm state of Texas had nothing to do with my decision to call a snow day. And tonight I continue to stress again, I really promise that this has nothing to do <laughs> with me being from Texas. Um, but all joking aside, these recent weather events were severe and necessitated numerous days of closure to ensure the safety of students, families, and staff. It was also evidence that the sheer volume of snow um, in a short period of time put unprecedented strain on the Muni's ability to remove the snow. And as always, we're willing to be all hands on deck to support the Muni however we can through this situation and future weather events. So with that weather event behind us, um, we do need to focus on a path forward. So to recap for the public, the district calendared uh, for two snow days. Because we closed for a total of seven days this year, we have been developing plans for how to address five days of lost learning time. While it's unlikely any plan will have universal support across every community member, I will say that staff and myself have done due diligence in consulting with numerous stakeholders, including union leadership, and uh, as recently as this afternoon, state the state. So with that said, and here's the dense part, um, pending state approval uh, and potentially board approval, the district proposes the following plan to address the makeup days. Uh, the administration recommends that from January 30th to March 9th, 30 minutes will be added to the instructional day. That is the equivalent of about three days total. Uh, and again, that would begin January 30th. Why do we choose that date? Because campus leaders need time to finalize how this impacts school schedules once we get back to school given the upcoming winter holiday. Additionally, February 22nd and 23rd um, will become full instructional days in lieu of the scheduled parent-teacher conferences with half school day, as was currently slated. Lastly, the district proposes making February 24th a full instructional day. That would be in lieu of the currently slated professional development day. So this adds roughly five instructional days back to the calendar. We recognize that this plan and any plan entails trade-offs. I've heard from many, many community members these past couple of weeks on this topic. Some advocated uh, for asking D to waive all five days and others on the opposite end of the spectrum advocated for adding days to the end of the calendar. The rationale behind this plan is that it minimally alters the calendar and recognizes the importance of instructional time. Many have wondered why the district did not opt for remote learning like others. In ASD, we would have needed students, particularly elementary students, to be in school long enough to receive technology and paper materials to aid in remote learning. Given the many consecutive snow days, uh, that was not feasible for a district of our size. So while not perfect, I do believe remote learning uh, is a viable option for future inclement weather days, but we want to make sure that we execute it well um, and to ensure true continuity of the learning experience. I do anticipate that remote learning will be a central part of our inclement weather strategy moving forward, and I've asked staff to begin planning for that. So in short, the district sees great value in the in-person learning experience and this plan, pending approval from DEED and the board, makes up for lost instructional time and causes less disruption than many of the other options uh, that were on the table. There are still particulars that need to be discussed with union leadership um, as soon as tomorrow, and then DEED still needs to formally approve this, but I intend to be collaborative with all of those stakeholders and others to get to resolution quickly.
So in the long term, this situation also opens the opportunity to look at future school calendars and propose adjustments that could account for similar weather events to the one that happened this month. So tonight, I really just wanted to share this high level overview of the current plan um, and staff will finalize and communicate the specifics in the coming days. Um, we appreciate the community's patience. Every additional snow day altered the path forward and necessitated input from the state, AEA leadership and others. That process took time and it was well worth it. And we're finally in a position to share a plan today. Um, so that is my snow update. So I'm sure there'll be questions and I'm happy to answer them. But again, I want to clarify that some details will need to emerge in the coming days now that the state and AEA and others are aware that this is coming. So I could address the snow questions now and then I want to go back to some broader observations. So when will we hear from, oh, we don't know when we're going to hear from Deed. Uh, it, and what, so was we there need a request to, to waive any of the days to Deed? So, Deed and I did have a conversation and what emerged is that we need to have a plan to address learning continuity. It was not going to be favorable um, from very many parties at all to advocate for full waivers, um, especially when there were multiple opportunities in our calendar to make up learning time in a way that was minimally disruptive. Um, and there was also an opportunity to add minutes. Um, so I will just keep it at the fact that Deed is aware of this plan. It won't be a surprise. And I intend to submit a waiver that outlines what I shared with the board. I um, mean, I have no reason to believe that that will not be approved, but I still need to receive formal notice from Deed in the coming weeks. So um, at what point will you anticipate it coming to the board? And then for the board specifically, we could put this in a memo going into next month as these changes wouldn't um, have any sort of formal impact until February, but we did want to put it out there because there will be some very specific questions, particularly with union leadership, just to clarify messaging and to iron out a few specifics um, that are not of interest to the general public, but are very important to me to make sure that we look out for our employees. Okay, thanks. Member Lesson. So I have two questions. Number one, winter hasn't actually started yet. Um, okay. Bad news. Uh, that happens in a couple more days. So what happens if we have additional snow days? That's my, that's question number one. And then question number two is what is our sense of start of um, time? So if we add 30 minutes to the instructional day, are we staying with morning, initial morning start times and then just adding 30 minutes or are we going earlier and later? Like, could you give us a sense of that direction because there are families who are going to need to plan. And I know that that's something that's going to come up and I'm not ready to share those specifics because there are also specific things I want to talk to AEA and others about before I share that plan. But I did want to share at a high level, this is how we'll address the time and now we need to address the logistics when it comes to start and end times. And again, this wouldn't start until January 30th. So I hope to iron out these specifics to where we can get to that point um, as soon as possible for families to be informed. In terms of the question about future snow days. Again, it, it depends on the magnitude. Um, making up one day is a very different proposition than making up a week or even more. Um, and this was truly unprecedented in that it was multiple weather events and consecutive weather days that really the calculus was changing in live time day by day. So it was a dynamic situation. But I will say that there are some merits to remote learning for a number of reasons. One, we wouldn't have to necessarily adjust the calendar. And two, if we have the time to deploy appropriate levels of technology and paper materials, I think that we can make remote learning work, but we weren't ready to do that, um, given how abruptly this weather event occurred. Okay, questions? Okay. Why don't you continue with your report? All right. So now, um, lastly, I just want to share a couple of just general reflections of, as a point of personal privilege, given um, that it's been about eight months of listening and learning as superintendent. So um, I, I do want to say that while this semester has been defined by a number of crises, it has shown me that this community is always willing to support our students, who is our city's future. Um, I saw that just weeks into my superintendency when we had to halt use of Ursa Major this summer due to seismic concerns. Uh, the community was quick to ask how they could support, and our school leaders on Jaber in particular ensured that Ursa Major students and teachers felt welcomed and embraced in their new schools. And I saw that resilience again when 
Thousands of community volunteers and the Muni and Jaber leaders and others assisted the district through a transportation crisis. And with their help, we finally put that short term challenge behind us. And then since July, our community has been sharing feedback and creative ideas with the district on ways that we can work together to address our structural deficit. And I was also heartened to, to meet many legislators and business leaders and assembly members and many others who have been sharing the true story of ASD and what's needed to catalyze state level change to, to really bolster education funding. Um, it takes a village to address this huge topic of school funding in Alaska, and we truly have have great people in our corner advocating for positive change. So that was heartening to me. And I'll close by saying all that to say thank you, Anchorage, and thank you to the staff and the board for your role in getting us through quite a challenging year for ASD. While planning for another even larger structural deficit for fiscal year 25 will be inevitable unless change happens at the state level, we made progress, we made progress tonight, um, and we'll continue to share how ASD and districts across the state got to these dire financial situations and what needs to be done to fix the root of the issue. So with some of these challenges behind us, I'm also ready to look towards our future as a district, and I'll be finalizing the staffing of my leadership team in the coming days so we can finally implement some of the changes that need to happen to achieve our goals. So that concludes my report. Happy holidays to all. I'll be personally dreaming of a white Christmas, but I won't be hoping for another 40 inches of snow, but that's just me. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Any questions? So before we, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Before we move on to uh, board, uh, school board and administrative comments, um, I know this is Dr. Stock's last, it snuck up on me because we were supposed to have a party tonight. Well, we had a little one, but we were supposed to have a real big party tonight, a special thing tonight. Um, but this is his last meeting with us. Uh, before he enters into um, retirement. And I, I just want to thank you for your leadership and your service. Um, and and I, if other board members wanted to say anything, I, it has to be really quick. But uh, I do want to thank you, sir. For there we go. Thank you. I will just say it's been an honor and a privilege and um, it's been, I've been going to executive sessions and school board meetings for 31 years. It's a lot of meetings. So what I think I'll do is retire and run for board so that Donnelly can get a second. Is that yeah. okay? There you go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It Thank really you. has been an honor and privilege. It's a great place to work. This is got great people here. You have great leadership and great, great uh, folks here. Um, some of the most competent people I've ever worked with in my career. So I hope uh, the board will continue to give administration uh, credibility and guidance for their recommendations when you can. Um, got a lot of tough times that lie ahead, but uh, it's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, let's uh, start with Member Holloman on board member comments. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, one, I'd like to thank Dr. Stock again for the work he's done over several years. It, they've been tough years. Yep. This has been uh, difficult times in Alaska. I do want to thank all of the administrative staff. Um, I've, I've been listening to board meetings for over a decade for various reasons. And um, they are more interesting when you get to vote. Um, I, was, I was told that by a former board member. But also just the the amount of differing opinions and perceptions and misperceptions. And you guys have to go away and make something out of it to bring back that we'll actually vote yes on at some point. I don't think a lot of people realize the amount of time you're having to spend on the budget issues. Because I know there's no book to look this stuff up in. You're having to come through the numbers over and over again and try to reconfigure things uh, and do things in a way that still work for students, but somehow make up millions of dollars. And it is not 
simple. It's not easy and it has to get four votes. Um, also want to take a moment to just thank teachers in the classroom. Again, we're having a very disrupted approach to Christmas, which is always a little crazy to begin with. Um, ultimately, no matter what happens when kids show up and walk through the doors, it's our building staff that make the district work over and over and over again. Um, and, and from what I can hear from people, once their kids do get in the doors, they, they're pretty happy with things that are happening in there. So those are just the two main things. And, uh, yeah, winter is coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Remember lessons. Um, thank you. I will try to be brief tonight. Um, echoing many of the points that Dr. Bryant shared about points of <laughs> gratitude and, and member Holloman, um, Dr. Stock, I am personally grateful for you and your leadership and um, for supporting me personally as a parent before I joined the board. So thank you. Um, I think that these are indeed dark days, but we have beautiful sunrises and spectacular sunsets. And we have um, the star on the mountain and we have students who really know and are able to do a lot of wonderful things. So uh, I had the privilege this morning of going to a sixth grade band and orchestra concert. And I thought I would share a, a lovely example of what students in sixth grade have been able to learn and master this year. The distinctions between, as their orchestra, as their band teacher said, between piano and forte and um as the orchestra teacher said they managed not to hit each other with two foot long wooden <laughs> sticks um so here are some uh, band students <laughs> Did a great job. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> she said she was going to be brief. <laughs> um, I think we should each take the opportunity to say thank you to Dr. Stock for your commu your commitment to the kids, families, and the community. So thank you for all that you've done, and I really hope you enjoy your retirement. <laughs> Well deserved. Um, and again, thank you to all of the staff because, boy, I know you guys have been putting some work in. So I, I really appreciate all that continued commitment and effort. And I, I, I know we're not done, but I, I thank you for all that. Um, I, I just wanted to share because so often we hear about test scores being low. We hear about the our, our kids um, that are having a difficult time, but, you know, I, in my conversations with with parents, um, I, I just want to start sh sharing. You know, when I have wonderful conversations, and and I was talking to um, a, a parent whose child, actually children, went through the traditional program. Um, I remember she said that they, their, her kids attended Trailside, um, and he, her son, is now a senior. And his biggest dilemma is choosing between colleges that he selected between Harvard, Harvard and Dartmouth. Mm. And so, I mean, these are the things that we need to share because our kids are doing amazing things. They, they really, every day I hear amazing stories. And it, I just wanted to throw out that one example. I mean, I, and, and I, I'll try to throw out one more example every meeting because it's it's really the work that the staff is doing, the work that the our teachers are doing, our TAs are doing. I mean, they, they're making a difference regardless of which program a parent chooses for their child and which program works for their child. So I was really excited to hear that and wanted to share that. Um, our communications meeting, committee meeting, is going to take place on Thursday, this Thursday, December 22nd at noon. Um, I'm excited that, well, I, 
MJ is great, right? See, we, we got to say it out loud. MJ is wonderful. And he's always, <laughs> I always appreciate his help for the comm meetings. And um, Sonia Hunt will be joining us to add um, an extra layer to the, our communications meeting regarding um, her work in community and her team's work in community engagement. So we'll have the communications portion of that as well as the communicate or community engagement um, from here forward. So thank you for that. I appreciate um, that added layer to our communications committee meeting. And and I just want to say happy holidays. And I hope and everybody has an opportunity to enjoy their families and and hopefully a little bit of time off so to regroup. Thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Member Donnelly. Thank you, Madam President. I, I just really want to thank Dr. Stock too. It's been six years we've been working together now, and uh, we uh, we had a couple years there where we were making some progress with academics, and then we had. Uh, biggest earthquake in 50 years and lost some ground there. And then just as we were getting back on course uh, to work back on academics, we had the worst pandemic in a hundred years and and we survived that. And, and that was, um, that was uh, quite the, uh, nobody had, nobody knew what to do, but I really appreciated your steady hand being here with us, helping us get through that Dr. Stock. And then, and now we're faced with this massive budget deficit um, so I, I'm going to miss you. I, I've really relied on you a lot for advice, and I, I've been very grateful. Thank you very, very much for your service to our district and our students and our, our families here in Anchorage. Thank you. Member Jacobs. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> um, just wanted to echo appreciation for Dr. Stock. Um, as uh, Member Donnelly um, indicated, you haven't had an easy tenure as deputy, and so um, Thank you for getting us through it, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing stories as you in, <laughs> engage in your next chapter. Um, did want to give a um, a shout out and thank you to the parents and students who have weathered, no pun intended, the um, last few weeks mm -hmm. along with us. You know, although plowing city streets isn't something that I can help with beyond maybe my corner of East Anchorage. Um, it's not the parents' fault either, right? It's not students' fault. Um, closing schools wasn't anyone's preferred option, but um, I'm glad we did so for safety, and um, I don't regret that. So um, hopefully we, we have more moderate weather um, now that winter is officially starting, and, um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Member Higgins. Well, I'm going to echo whatever else is said. I remember the first time I've... Um, met with Dr. Spock in regards to a compliance issue. He probably doesn't remember, but I do. <laughs> and um, uh, and listening to his background and his explanation and the issues involved with it um, kind of kept me from going off the deep end. So I appreciate that. I, I went off deep end for other reasons, though. But uh, <laughs> but the, the, your, your credibility and your... <laughs> yeah, I'm going to blame you for that, too. Uh, but your credibility and your, what you bring to the job here is something that has been really important. And I am very, uh, greatly appreciate it and a tremendous amount of respect. So I'm going to miss you not having you here. I really mean it. Um, just in regards to comments, I know that, um, it's not because you're from Texas with the other, but we never had this serious a problem with this many days off before you became superintendent. So I don't want you to get walk away too easily on that one within it. I just want to throw this out with the snow issue uh, for the public. What bothers me right now is when you go down the street and you're watching kids walk on the street, which used to be two lanes, which is one lane in dark going to school and under these unsafe conditions. And it was still going forward with that. I know we're doing what we have to do, but I've never seen the lack of clearing of streets or anything else. I saw six feet of snow one day uh at my place and we still never had this type of prolong not moving the snow not not doing stuff that's necessary for the community it jeopardized the jobs it jeopardized safety i'm watching people walk on the street on the Seward highway uh because there's no place else to walk um this is it's out of control and i just i'm real concerned about the safety for kids i know we can only do so much 
But the fact that we took these days off and trying to deal with it, I appreciate. It puts safety first and the kids first, and I uh, totally support and appreciate the superintendent's decisions with this. Those had to be tough decisions every day because you were trying to avoid being shut down forever. And let's face it, the streets still aren't straight uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But it was a tough decision, and I uh, appreciate and support the decision that was made. And last comment is that listen to a lot of comments tonight um, in regards to the budget cuts and what we're doing and the stresses associated with people and the concerns about it. What I appreciate out of it is that everybody came in here convinced to me that they were emotional fighting for the kids and they put their, they, their comments were really focused on what's best for kids. And hopefully that became, you know, that's always all focus at this point. And I, the fact that they came out to speak uh, with all the traffic or anything else they had to do, I just really appreciate the fact that they're that uh, committed and that connected and wanting to do that much for the kids. It means a lot. And I thought their comments were right on and I appreciate that a great deal. So with that, happy holidays to everyone and we'll see you next year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I have just a few comments. <clears throat> As we know, the governor uh, released his um, budget um, and there is a new initiative in his budget. Uh, the I think he's calling it the Market Alaska. Um, we know that what brings people to Alaska is actually opportunities. And in order to attract people to come here, we, you know, we, we've got to have great schools, not just our schools, but education throughout our state. So I am hopeful that as we move forward with creating this marketing of Alaska initiative, that there will be conversations around education and the value it brings to our economy. So I'm really encouraged about that. We have the workers of tomorrow. They are here in our schools throughout this state. And if we're going to invest in our future, we've got to continue to push forward. And uh, all of us, our, fam our families, our business partners, our staff, we've got to push and work for an increase and a prioritization of public education. And so um, it, I was really upset when I first saw the budget, the, the mayor, the governor's budget. But then I thought, okay, so this is another opportunity for us to really reach out and, 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 and define the value that we bring to this. Because people don't move here unless they, they their kids are gonna get a good education. And if we are not investing in education or continue to invest and the rate that we are currently going, I probably would have found somewhere else to leave uh, to, to raise my kids. And I've been here 50 years. So there, there is a glimmer of hope. We got to build on it. Uh, my final, not final, but I have a couple more. Um, someone mentioned tonight uh, the activity that we did on, um, I wish I could take on, on uh, uh, December 10th. I wish I could take total credit for it. I mean, I collaborated a little bit with Dr. Stock, <laughs> uh, but it was Dr. Stock, Dr. Stock's idea, and he and his team came up with all, all the pieces to that activity. And uh, so I, and I will miss that about you. And I, I really wanted to repeat all the stockisms tonight. <clears throat> I don't have them, uh, but we'll have to invite you back so we can do all the stockisms. Um, anyway, I just. We just can't forget that education funding is a way to grow our workforce and to attract people to our state. So we got to we got to do that. Do you have any final? Just a couple okay. of sentences. So one, I agree with your sentiments, Madam President, that the research is clear. Um, people want great neighborhoods and great schools. So the future of Alaska is right here in our schools. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that we can get to a place where we can um, solve uh, some of these structural inequities that exist. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to also jump on the Dr. Stock train. <laughs> um, so I've had um, incredible um, teammates throughout my career. And I am not exaggerating when I say that Dr. Stock is among 
one of the finest administrators in the business. So it's been a true blessing to work alongside him the past uh, six to eight months, um, and he will be missed. Um, he contributed to our past, but uh, he also played a huge role in contributing to our future because he has been providing me a lot of institutional knowledge, and he's also been um, onboarding Sven, who will take the reins as CAO come January. So um, thank you for setting us up for success. Um, I think this is going to be a great next few years. So thank great. you. I bet we could find a project or two to bring him back. <laughs> All right, guys. I, uh, with that, uh, let's. I'll take entertain a motion to dismiss. Move to adjourn. Second. Moved and second to adjourn. Uh, any opposition? Seeing none. <laughs> we saved by the bell. It is ten. Uh, what is that? Ten forty? No, eleven forty. What is that? Ten forty-five. Thank you, guys. Recording stopped.